welcome everybody. My name is uh, Johnny Lee, and uh, today we're here at the Nuclear and Particle Physics with Gravitational Waves. We have a bunch of exciting talks on the whole spectrum of, of gravitational waves. Um, and so without further ado, because we're running one minute over time, uh, let me introduce uh, the first speaker, which is uh, Bak Bashkar. Sorry, <laughs> Bashkar. Uh, and he's going to talk about constraining the neutral star properties with a new equation of state insensitive approach. And so, Bashkar, whenever you're ready, let me spotlight you and feel free to go ahead. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, so my name is Bhaskar. I am a postdoctoral researcher at Hamburg Observatory. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, constraining neutron star properties with a new equation of state insensitive um, approach. So I'll start with a brief uh, uh, introduction about neutron star. Uh, unfortunately, uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, uh, so I'll start with a brief introduction about the neutron star. Um, uh, so as you all know that the neutron stars are the remnant of a supernova explosion. Uh, so generally, uh, a, a typical neutron star has a mass between 1 to 2 solar mass, and it has a radius of the order of 10 to 15 kilometers. So from this number, you can estimate the density of the neutron star is enormous. So one obvious question to the physicist is that uh, uh, what is neutron star made of? So here at the right, uh, I show you a schematic diagram of the neutron star interior. So the current idea is that the neutron star poses a, um, a crust, which has a thickness of one to two kilometer. And inside the crust, uh, the nuclei, they are arranged in a lattice form. And as we go from the surface of the neutron star to the inner core part of the neutron, uh, to the center, uh, the density increases dramatically. So for example, at the surface of the neutron star, density is of the order of 10 to the power 4 gram per semi-cube. And at the center of the neutron star, density uh, could reach up to 10 to the power 15 gram per semi-cube. And as we move uh, from the surface to the uh, inner part of the neutron star, uh, uh, the matter becomes more and more nuclear rich. Uh, and, um, and at the inner core part of the neutron star, even the neutron protons, they can break and form quarks. So as we know, uh, so I, as we do not know uh, neutron star equation of state, uh, so uh, we try to find out uh, 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 it through for, from the observables. So the properties of the neutron star uh, is encoded in its equation of state, which is a relationship between the pressure and density inside the neutron star. So here uh, at the left, I show you three schematic diagram of neutron star equation of state. Uh, so at the uh, bottom, this is a one example of a soft equation of state for which uh, the pressure increases uh, less rap rapidly with the increment of the density. And at the top, this is one example of the stiff equation of state for which pressure increases uh, more rapidly with the increment of the density. And the corresponding mass radius sequences are shown here in this uh, right plot. And you can see uh, the radius of the neutron star are larger for the stiffer equation of state compared to the softer one. And there is a quantity called tidal deformability is plotted as a function of mass for this three equation of state. And this tidal deformability quantity is important for the gravitational wave observations because it tells us, um, uh, it tells us how uh, easy to deform a neutron star uh, against some external tidal perturbation. Now, uh, uh, tidal deformability is larger for the stiffer equation of state compared to the softer one. Uh, so that means it is easier to deform a neutron star which has a stiffer equation of state compared to a softer one. Now, from the observations, from the astrophysical observations, we get the macroscopic uh, properties of the neutron star, such as the, the measurement of the mass and radius and the measurement of the tidal deformity from the, uh, from the gravitational wave observations. And uh, this, all of these uh, uh, macroscopic properties, they tell us about the neutron star equation of state. So we can combine all those information together and uh, we can put a joint constraint on the neutron star equation of state. Uh, now, uh, traditionally, uh, uh, the way we constrain the neutron star equation of state, uh, uh, we uh, first built a parameterization of it. So one uh, uh, most commonly used parameterization is uh, piecewise polytrope. So uh, the, we, what we do here, uh, we, uh, we, 
we break the pressure density plane inside the neutron star in several polytropic pieces such that the polytropic indices are gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. So these uh, polytropic indices are the free parameters in, in, in this parameterization, and we can vary these parameters and uh, produce a, a large range of equation of states. Now our target is to constrain these equation of state parameters from the observations, and the way we do is using the Bayesian statistics. And uh, here I linked my PSS thesis in case you want to uh, uh, into know more detail about it. But I'll talk uh, I'll talk about it briefly. Uh, so here, uh, this is the Bayes theorem. So we, we are trying to find out the posterior probability distribution of this parameter given the astrophysical observations. And that is proportional to the prior of the parameters and times the likelihood. So here the likelihood as uh, in likelihood we have combined multiple observations because we can uh, here each observations are taken as independent observations. So since these are independent, we can mu multiply the likelihood uh, with uh, with uh, uh, together and put a, uh, construct a joint uh, joint likelihood. Now uh, the computation of this equation is actually expensive uh, because uh, uh, for each equation of state parameter we have to solve Q of equations and we also have to calculate tidal uh, deformability and and then uh, we can compare uh, compare those equation of state with the observables. And this process has to be repeated for many, many equation of state. So roughly of the order of 10 to the 7 times to get a well converged equation of state posterior. And this will keep on increasing as we have uh, we, we have more and more observations. So here uh, in this work, uh, we propose another uh, way. Uh, so that is that how about parameterizing uh, um, uh, the macroscopic properties of the neutron star, such as the radius of uh, and the tidal deformity of a neutron star as a function of mass. So th therefore, since we are, uh, we are parameterizing the macroscopic properties, and uh, then we don't need to solve the TOV equation. And uh, and uh, and uh, th that will be a, a very uh, uh, a, a much faster approach compared to the traditional approach which I just talked about. Now, uh, how how do you do it? Uh, so here we parameterize the mass as a function of log lambda, so that we have uh, four free parameters in our model. So th those are b zero, b one, b two, b three, and one example I, I show at this right hand side plot where uh, uh, the SLY equation of state is plotted and also the uh, corresponding fitted curve is also shown by this parameterization. And at the, uh, at, and, uh, at the bottom, you see the uh, error in the, uh, in the, in the you know, fitting is, show, is also shown, uh, shown as a function of lambda. And you can see the error is always uh, uh, less than 1%. And uh, since this curve is also a monotonically increasing function, so we can actually derivative this mass as a uh, with respect to lambda. And if we put the derivative to zero, we'll get the maximum mass. So we can find the maximum mass also as a function of these four parameters. And now to get the radius, uh, we can use uh, one equation of state insensitive relationship between the compactness of the neutron star and the tidal deformability. So let's say uh, given a parameter set and given a value of lambda, we can calculate uh, the mass using this uh, uh, pa parametric model. Now we can put uh, th that mass value and the tidal deformability uh, value in this uh, uh, in this US insensitive relation, and we can get the, get the radius. So therefore, all the macroscopic properties uh, of a neutron star can be defined uh, by these four free parameters. So now our, our target is to constrain uh, those uh, 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 free parameters uh, from the uh, astrophysical observations using Bayesian statistics. So uh, uh, one thing we need is the prior of these parameters. So to get the prior of the parameter, uh, parameters, we actually uh, fit uh, uh, a wide range of equation of state model, which are taken from the literature. And uh, he, uh, you can see the names of the equation of state is uh, we, we consider uh, here in, at this table. And the corresponding fitted parameters are sh also shown. And, uh, and the maximum error in the in our fitting is uh, give, given by uh, given in this column. And you can see that the maximum error is uh, 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 for most of the cases it is the error is of the order of 1%, in some cases 4%, but uh, that is mostly for the uh, stiff equation of state. 
Now, uh, uh, from here, uh, we, we get the prior ranges of the uh, parameters as well, and we take all the uh, priors to be uniform, uh, uh, and uh, the minimum and maximum values of the parameters are chosen from this table. Now I'll show the results. Uh, so uh, here uh, at the left, uh, the posterior probabilities of these parameters is shown uh, with respect, uh, and also their correlation is shown uh, with some uh, uh, radius values and tidal deformity values of uh, 1.4 and uh, 2.08 solar mass neutron star. And uh, here we combine uh, um, different type of observation together. So first we combine radio observations, then we combine gravitational wave observation, and then we combine the X-ray observation, uh, which is provided by the NICER collaboration. So probably you cannot read this uh, 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 parameter value properly. So I'll just focus your attention to the right-hand side plot. Uh, where the constraint uh, in the mass radius is uh, uh, in the, in the mass radius plane is shown. So at the top uh, left is this is the right uh, ninety percent prior on the mass radius plane uh, based on our uh, para uh, parametric model, and then after that we add radio observation. Then at the uh, bottom left we add uh, gravitational observation uh, with the uh, combining the radio and. And, and finally, we add all the all the observation together, and the joint constraint is shown by this shaded color. So you see that we, we have started with this black dashed prior, and now this is the posterior uh, of the neutral star mass radius after combining only four observations. So uh, right uh, right now, the uh, uncertainty in the radius of 1.4 solar mass neutron star is uh, roughly plus minus five percent. So therefore, the future looks promising. So I'll now summarize my talk. So uh, I present uh, we present an alternative way to constrain the neutron star equation of state combining uh, multi uh, uh, multi messenger observations. The idea is that instead of parameterizing uh, parameterizing the equation of state, we can parameterize we can directly parameterize the macroscopic properties of the neutron star, such as we can parameterize the radius and tidal deformability as a function of mass. And then we have inferred, uh, we, we have constrained those uh, US insensitive parameters uh, using Bayesian statistics combining multiple observations. And uh, the main uh, uh, selling point of our approach is that this is a much faster, faster process than the traditional approach. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me uh, quickly see if there are any questions. This is, uh, we've got a little bit more time, so do not hesitate. Any questions? I think you can either raise your hand or uh, type your question and then I can, I can, I should be able to, yes, I think people should be able to unmute and speak. Okay, there's a question from Jan. Jan, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Uh, please, uh, I don't understand the general thing. Uh, I mean, we, we have neutron star, it has some, uh, we have some equation state and uh, we, we calculate what is the, uh, what is the, uh, in the composition of the, of the neutron star as you, as you plot it at the, at the beginning. But uh, how do from the multi messenger observations we obtain uh, we obtain the structure of the neutron star? I don't think I, I didn't see from your lecture uh, this uh, general thing. Uh, so how from the multi messenger observations we uh, ob obtain uh, the composition of the neutron star? Okay, thank you. Um, that's a very good question. So uh, the multi messenger observation gives us uh, uh, the uh, the measurement of the macroscopic properties of the neutron star. So for example, the red, the X-ray observations, they gives us the mass radius measurement of neutron star. Let's say uh, one measure, uh, one mass radius measurement will be here, and uh, the gravitational observation gives us the uh, measurement of mass and tidal deformity of the neutron star. So this has an error bar. So let's say uh, the error bar is look like this. So now uh, we. Uh, the way we const uh, constrain the equation of state, uh, we combine all these uh, 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 observations together, uh, such that we uh, because all the uh, all the neutron stars share the same equation of state, so we can combine the observation together and we get joint constraint. 
So to do that, uh, uh, one can uh, one need to build a parametric model of the neutron star equation of state. So the parametric model could be the, the parameters in, in pressure density. So that is one example is besides polytrope. Uh, or here in this work, I I, I talked about a, a, another way of parameterization. Uh, that is that instead of parameterizing the microscopic properties, or that means the pressure density, we can also parameterize the uh, the macroscopic properties like mass and tidal deformity. So this uh, the, in this parametric model, we have uh, some free parameters. So the free parameters are here this B, B i. So there are four free parameters. So these three parameters tells us about the equation of state. So basically we can vary these three parameters uh, and we can generate a large number of equation of state. And then we combine and the multi-messenger observation together to find out uh, which parameters actually fits the data better. So that's the result is shown here. And the corresponding, uh, the constraint on the mass radius, I show you here. So for example, right, uh, the prior was given here at, in this black dashed curve. Then once we combine all the multi-messenger observation together, then this is the joint constraint we get. So the multi, we are learning about the neutron star equation of set once we add the observation one by one, uh, one with another. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, we have another question from Suprovo. Go ahead. Hi, hi, Vaska. Thanks for the nice talk. So I wanted to ask you about like here the posterior in this slide only. So the posterior you are showing. So how do they match with the uh, other parameterized equation of state analysis like piecewise polytrope or spectral? Like do they match or there is any difference in your analysis with that result? Okay, so uh, our result is consistent with uh, other approaches. So maybe there is a little bit uh, uh, difference but, uh, in the inferred properties. Like uh, let's say if we infer the radius of 1.4 solar mass uh, coming from this model and uh, coming from the piecewise spectrum, uh, there will be a little bit differences, but those differences are consistent with each other. Uh, that means, I mean, uh, they are consistent within the one sigma in interval. So uh, not only, uh, I mean, there are uh, there are other people also who are working with uh, working on the same thing, and they construct uh, uh, different different equation of set parameterization. Uh, so uh, all the results right now they are consistent with each other, with little differences. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we are pretty much out of time. And I would like to thank Bashkar again for the, for the great talk. And I suggest that we move on to the next uh, talk, which is by uh, Justin, Justin Ripley, uh, who's gonna be talking about probing the viscous interior of neutron stars with gravitational waves from inspiring neutron stars. Okay. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm a postdoc at the University of Illinois, um, Urbana-Champaign. I'll be talking about some work I've been doing with um, Abhishek and Nicola Sinez, um, and mostly I'll just be trying to highlight um, some results from a recent preprint. Uh, so just to, to review a few basics, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this, but we typically you model a neutron star with a relativistic perfect fluid stress energy tensor. So here rho is the rest mass energy density and P is the pressure. And very common question is, what is the equation of state then of the star? So you can phrase its internal nuclear properties. How does pressure depend on the rest mass energy density? Um, a typical way people get at this, as the previous speaker mentioned, is you have the tidal deformability, which is relates the linear response of the star's quadrupole moment, QIJ, to the external gravitational field that feels uh, EIJ. So lambda is that proportionality constant. And lambda is indirectly determined by the um, equation of state. Now, there's already been um, at least indirect constraints on a whole class of equation of states already through measurements of lambda um, through the um, binary neutron star merger GW 170817. And you've all seen this plot before, but just to remind you, um, we have two tidal deformability parameters, lambda 1 and lambda 2, for the two stars. What we're showing here is the probability density of the posterior of those two values. And what we see is that um, several different equations of state give values of lambda that seem to be incompatible with the data. So already certain 
we can already potentially rule out those equations of state and release those two neutron stars. Okay. Um, but what we'll, be, what we'll be focusing on is how can you constrain not the equation of state, but higher order corrections that could enter in your description of the neutron star stress energy tensor. Um, and within the fluid description, that's through viscous corrections, so out of equilibrium corrections. And what I'm showing here is the um, bulk viscosity zeta multiplied by the uh, fluid expansion. And here you have the shear viscosity times the fluid shear. And you could add higher order other terms like heat conduction, but let's just focus on these two. And a natural question you could ask then is how does zeta and eta, these extra viscous parameters, how do those depend on the rest mass energy density? At least that's one way you can phrase this question if the temperature doesn't vary too much in the star. So already uh, people have thought about this, at least during, in the context of neutron star mergers, because you know when, when they're merging, things are very out of equilibrium and viscous effects could be important. And this has been mostly studied with uh, numerical relativity simulations. I'm just showing you an example panel from a paper by um, Elias Most and others, where they were colliding stars using, um, well, numerical relativity, usually you model these things as perfect fluids, as he did in this paper, but then you can look at the time gradients and spatial gradients of your solution and ask, well, given some parametric form of zeta and eta, how, um, how much could that change the solution? And there's some evidence through those sorts of reasoning that viscous corrections could be fairly important during the merger and post-merger phase and potentially impact the uh, gravitational wave signal there. But what about the in-spiral? Could there be out of equilibrium, out of equilibrium uh, effects during the in-spiral that you could potentially measure? And that's what we studied in our, uh, in our preprint. And what we found is that if you, you can parametrize out of equilibrium effects with the what's called the dissipative tidal deformability, which we'll call uh, capital C, um, and it gives you to a correction to the gravitational wave phase. And maybe the interesting part of this is that this correction could be could give you a correction to the phase as larger or if not larger than the tidal deformability lambda, depending on how strong viscous effects are. Um, in particular, and I'll explain more how we got to here, but the, these viscous effects could enter the gravitational wave at fourth post-Newtonian order, so one post-Newtonian order lower than lambda, and C, um, C also receives a large finite size correction, which can boost it and make it parametrically large enough to be observable with ground phase detectors. So the rest of this talk, I'll try to explain how we uh, reached this conclusion. So first I'll describe just briefly review how you compute the gravitational wave phase, because it actually turns out to be important to understand the result. Um, then review tidal response of relativistic stars and how we extend it to uh, uh, a dissipative tidal response. And then I'll put it all together by doing just sort of quickly reviewing the post calculation to see how you get that phase that I just flashed above. Uh, so just to review, we, you measure gravitational waves, for example, with the vial scalar and uh, put as a function of frequency. Here's the amplitude, here's the phase. And what we'll be using is this following differential equation for how phase varies with the frequency. So the second derivative of the phase with respect to the gravitational wave frequency is just the inverse of the time derivative of the orbital energy. Um, and that should also read total, that's a typo. And then the change in the orbital energy also with respect to um, the frequency. So the name of the game then is to, what we're doing is computing the total energy. That should be total right there. Uh, if we're a Newtonian binary, include the dissipative tidal response, and then apply the quadrupole formula, plug in this formula, and then you'll get the phase. Okay. So let's review the tidal response. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but we need to review a little bit of the basics just so we can see how it's extended. You have some incoming tidal field. For example, in a relativistic context for a quadrupole, you'd have the um, electric part of the vial tensor has some function of time. Here's your star, it's deforming, and it has some quadrupole, which functions with, as a, which uh, varies also as a function of time. And if what we'll be assuming here is that the change in time of your external field is it's changing much less rapidly than the internal dynamical time scales of your star. And this is often parametrized in terms of the F mode or the, you look at the longest period mode of your star, and then you say, well, the change, the external change to it should be much smaller than that. And then also second derivative should be much smaller than first derivative and so on and so forth. And if you do that, a common one onsets you can use common in Newtonian physics, physics as well as to expand the quadrupole response in terms of first the prompt response. So this is just, this will be related to the tidal love number time plus higher derivative corrections of E. 
Um, so notice we'll be we'll be focusing on this one here. And these tau parameters are just um, they have this has units of time, units of time squared. In particular, this one will enter the dissipative tidal number, and you can see how that would enter because this is um, this changes sign if you t to minus t it changes sign. So you see there's some time directionality to this piece. Um, well, this one has it's even in time. Okay. Uh, so what is this parameter uh, tau two? Um, it's you can relate it to this very classical picture. It goes back to the uh, 19th century, which is the tidal lag of your star. So if your e your field's coming in and your stars, it's not quite tracking the field anymore. It's it's delayed by a little bit of a time tau d, which is related to the internal viscous time scales of your star. If you Taylor series expand, you see how it, you can relate these two pictures, and that's a that's kind of the classical picture of how to interpret this in the Newtonian context and it, in relativity it should work too. Um, so now let's go to the uh, tidal uh, deformabilities. Um, we define the compactness of the star where its mass divided by its radius. A here just labels the two stars, A and B are the two stars. Um, from there, we can take our lambda two parameter and define a dimensionless tidal deformability, capital lambda, just divide this by its mass. And if we reduce dimensionless parameters, we get what's called the tidal deformability or the apsidal constant divided by the um, compactness to the fifth power. So that's sort of what they call a finite size enhancement for less compact objects, fixing tidal love number. This gets bigger because this goes to zero. Similarly, we can do this for the next order term, lambda two times tau. To make this dimensionless, we're just going to set C and G and everything to one. We divide by N to the six. And what you get is the Absidal constant divided by compactness to the sixth power times the tidal damping time, uh, the tidal uh, lag time divided by the light crossing time of the star. That's its radius divided by C. So that's how we're going to define these dimensionless parameters. And these are the ones that are going to enter the waveform. Uh, so, in terms of the microphysics of the star, tau d is the new physical parameter you want to predict um, with some sort of model of the star and then constrain with gravitational wave ultimately, gravitational wave observations ultimately. Uh, many different physical processes can contribute to tau d. I mentioned zeta and eta, but um, you can think of zeta and eta as almost effective parameters that could have many different kinds of physical contributions. For example, well, the first thing that come to mind is the molecular viscosity of this effective fluid, but there's also things like so-called the anomalous viscosities like turbulence could actually mimic viscosity. Uh, the crust can give some sort of effective viscous correction. Um, ERCA processes, I mean, it's really the molecular, but this is just a, a list, and Abhishek will talk more about how you could potentially compute this with a concrete model. Uh, one last way to understand this, let's go to frequency space for the moment. So Q mu nu equals some tidal response times E mu nu, and now we're in frequency space, that's what omega is. Let's take this generic frequency space response and expand it into an even and an odd part where we call lambda of omega, now it's called the dynamical tide in the literature. This piece is conservative, um, which is that omega minus omega goes to, it changes, you know, the, the equation says it here. Um, this captures the normal mode excitations of the star, so the modes that don't dissipate energy, like the F mode excitation. And then we have the other piece, C, which gives, which is, it changes sign, it's the opposite piece, with those who completes your description of F. Um, a heuristic intuitive model you can use to understand this is if Q just responded to the external field as a damped simple harmonic oscillator. And if the driving frequency was much less than the mode frequency, this is the damping time, you can expand it in omega. And we see there's an even part that's going to contribute, contribute to lambda. We have an odd part that contributes to C. C. This model doesn't give you a, a static prompt response, but this is just a heuristic picture. Okay. Um, so now let's go to our Newtonian calculation. We have quasi-circular binary, MA and MB. They're going in a circle. I reduced units very briefly here just to say they're going much less than the speed of light. And then a, a classical Newtonian formula for the uh, center of mass acceleration of these two objects. That's what A is here, the center of mass acceleration. Here's the point particle piece. And then we have finite size contributions um, to the Newtonian equations of motion where Q, A, and B are just, these are the symmetric trace free components of their quadrupole moments. And what's the novelty? Okay, you take Q, I, J, you have your lambda, E, I, J bit, the prompt response, and then you just add this uh, delay piece. Okay, so we have our equations of motion. It completely describes this picture. 
From here, we can compute the energy and the change in energy over time due to this piece. Going through that calculation, we find that the orbital energy is equal to um, the point particle piece plus these finite size lambda corrections, classical calculation, and then the dissipative piece here, which includes C. So the word dissipation, dissipative number, you see where it comes from here, it's giving you a DEDT. Okay, so now we can plug this into our phasing formula if we include um, the gravitational wave piece. So we include the gravitational contribution just using the standard uh, quadruple formula. So we're just doing the lowest order uh, corrections here. Uh, when you do that, integrate twice, and look, you get the formula I quoted earlier, which is the, the phasing as a function of uh, frequency. So I'm just rewriting it here. So what you find is you factor out the uh, quadrupole piece, and you find a 4 pn correction um, from xi and a 5 pn 5 pn correction for lambda. This is standard. This has been you know this has been known for a long time. This is potentially uh, novel. And even though it's 4 pn, you think there might be some degeneracy between this parameter and your start time. There's a log term which breaks that degeneracy. Okay. And remember this cat this piece hidden in lambda is a one over compactness to the five, and hidden here is a one over compactness to the six. Okay, so this calculation, I just uh, ran through very quickly. What did I assume? I assume the stars were not spinning, um, if you remember. And that's actually something that, as, because of this tidal lagging, there's a, they can be tidally torqued and slowly spun up as they inspiral. So is the no spin approximation, uh, is, that, um, is that consistent with our calculation? Well, it turns out, and this is um, a very old result, so the first people to study viscous uh, effects in stars were, were thinking of this too. Um, and it turns out if you look at the tidal torquing, which comes from the misalignment of the quadrupole with the gravitational field, you find that for neutron stars, they're um, sufficiently compact that they don't actually get appreciably spun up before they merge, if they were initially not spinning. Um, so our no spin approximation actually turns out to be um, pretty accurate and doesn't seem to affect um, our, it doesn't affect our calculation of leading order. Um, so you might be scratching your head, how can a finite size effect that, that appears at, um, with a finite size uh, out of equilibrium effect in the phase at 4 pn order, because you may have heard of the effacement principle, which is that finite size effects of objects enter their equations of motion at 5 pn. And it turns out actually these dissipative finite size effects enter the star's equations of motion at 6.5 pn, very high pn order. So how could it enter the phase at such low pn order? relative to 6.5? Um, no, that's the question. And the key is you have to look at the phasing formula again so that um, the dissipation enters here through E dot and it's 4 pn relative to the gravitational wave contribution. So look at the equations of motion again. Gravitational wave radiation reaction will enter equations of motion at 2.5 pn. So in, in effect, what this E dot is saying, because um, the viscous correction enters E dot. It's actually kind of competing with the gravitational wave uh, effect. So it's 6.5 minus the 2.5 of the gravitational wave radiation reaction, which gives you 4 pn. Kind of uh, very heuristic, but I'm trying to give you some intuition for how this could happen. The reason why finite size, the lambda enters at the equations of motion at 5 pn, and the phase at 5 pn is because it's only interacting through the uh, conservative piece, which is how you compute this part here. And so that's how you get the low. Okay. Uh, just to run over some previous work, um, so I already mentioned this old result by Bilson and Cutler. They were looking at what is the value of viscosity you would need to have the stars spin up fast enough through tidal torquing so that they were tidally locked. If the stars are tidally locked, this is a 2 pn effect. It actually affects the phase fairly significantly. But what they found is if you, had a vis if you, had, if you wanted a viscosity large enough or a, a damping time uh, short enough, um, long enough such that uh, damping time short enough such that the stars become tidally locked, you would need um, unphysically large values of viscosity. The time scale for momentum transport across your star would need to be equal to the speed of light, roughly. So that sort of ruled out people thought at least that viscosity would be important due to this effect. Other people have looked then since then, there were people were looking at um, conservative time to corrections to QIJ. So just looking at pieces like this. This comes from expanding the equations of motion in terms of like a simple harmonic oscillator for the stars with no damping. Just, just it. Yes. Uh -huh. Time's up. Please wrap up. 
Oh, time's up. Sorry. <laughs> Ran out of time. Um, so this is the end of the slides and this is our conclusion. Sorry for running over. No, no problem. I just want to make sure we leave some time for questions as well. No, sorry, I misread the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, questions. I see that Jocelyn has her hand up. Go ahead. Hi, could I see the slide that you uh, skimmed over at the end there? Um, yes. Um, yeah. So we just took a generic approach. And, um, if you don't think about title locking. Um... Uh, OK, yeah, yeah thank you. OK, any more questions? Can I ask a question? Sorry, I cannot raise my hand. Mm -hmm. Wait, who is speaking? Um, Haskar. OK, uh, go for it, Haskar. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, so uh, if I understand correctly, I mean, um, you have introduced a uh, dissipative title deformability to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to take into account of the dissipation. Mm -hmm. So is this similar to the title hitting for black hole? Um, yeah, it is. It's related to um, it's related to the dissipative title number for black holes, and I think people knew that dissipation entered for black hole binaries at four p.m. And all we're saying is that it also enters for neutron stars, and it receives this finite size enhancement. So it's actually um, a potentially larger effect for neutron stars, depending on the microphysics. Um, but uh, if I remember correctly, just uh, I mean, if you can uh, you can correct me. I mean. Uh, mm -hmm. For black hole, it might be uh, potentially observable because the dissipative e effect for the black hole is proportional to the mass. Uh, yes. Yeah. For neutron star, uh, you need to have an enormous large viscosity uh, so that we can uh, probe this kind of uh, dissipative effect from the in spiral phase. Um, uh, so yes, but like, because of this finite size enhancement, it's not as large as people thought. And it puts it within a, phys a range, a physical range that actually is some, uh, some estimates uh, it's within the it's within some estimates for what the uh, effective viscosity of first stars could be because of this large finite size enhancement now but i agree yeah for, for large black holes it could also be measurable okay thank you okay we have time for a short question before we move on to the next talk uh Supervo, go ahead yeah so one question like if the dissipation is happening. If uh, you say the mode oscillation is getting dissipated, you say the larger contribution L equals to M equals to that is giving the tidal deformity. So will it change the definition of tidal deformity in terms of this dissipative? It is there so whether we will actually see the tidal deformity or we see a much lesser, we need to modify the definition in presence of a dissipative term. Um. So if I understand correctly, are you saying, so I mean, we're not changing the definition of lambda, we're just, um, we're sort of adding a new, a new parameter that behaves differently under time, time, time reversal. And it, it's another parameter, so it might weaken your concern on this if you include both of them in your analysis, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't change the definition of lambda. So, okay, so the question was like, if you look at the tidal deformity derivations, there is a gamma term, the dissipative term, that generally people ignore, saying that it will yeah. not be very effective. But if you now input this term, as you're saying that, so will the definition will uh, change or the definition remains the same? You mean uh, this, uh, uh, sorry. you mean uh, like the simple harmonic oscillator model? Yeah, um, simple harmonic true. oscillator model, yeah. Uh, I don't. I guess maybe I not quite understand the question. Um, what definition will change? Um, okay, maybe I can ask you. Maybe you can ask offline. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Sounds good. We can either do offline or there's going to be a ten minute break after this talk. I'd be happy mm -hmm. to keep the session alive for for some more in depth discussion. But uh, considering the time, I do suggest that we move on. And so next up, we've got Abhishek, and he's going to give part two of this talk. So Abhishek, can you start sharing your screen mm -hmm. and take it away whenever you're ready? Uh, good morning, I guess, uh, wherever you are. Uh, and welcome to my talk. So I'll continue on what Justin was talking about and pro talk more about probing internal disparity processes with gravitational waves. Okay. 
Yeah, so just to recap, you know, finite size effects of a compact object are imprinted onto the gravitational wave spectrum through its tidal response. Um, in the low frequency limit, you can just expand the star's quadrupole moment in terms of um, an external tidal field and its time derivatives. So at the zeroth order, you have ah, at the zeroth order, you have just the adiabatic or prompt response, and then um, if you continue the series, you get um, a dissipative response at first order, and then again conservative effects at second order, and so on. Uh, the important property to note is that the lambda 2, 0 and uh, the tidal act time tau d both probe distinct physical processes of neutron stars. And so both of them could be potentially important. And uh, tidal locking is very familiar uh, because anticipative tides are very well known to us. Uh, one simple, simple example is, you know, the moon is tidally locked to the orbit uh, around the earth. So you only see one phase of the moon. But if it was not tidally locked, and if there was no tidal dissipation, then you would see both sides of the moon. As Justin mentioned, uh, Bilstein and Cutler actually looked at um, these effects. They looked at if tidal locking is possible for neutron star binaries, and then they concluded that unphysically large values of viscosities are uh, needed to actually tidally lock neutron stars. But the point is, even if the star is not tidally locked, the dissipative properties can show up in the gravitational wave, uh, waveform. Just to recap the gravitational waveform, uh, you have the, the star's response, which I showed before. Um, you have you define two dimensionless tidal deformities. You have uh, capital lambda A, which is related to lambda two, and then you have C, uh, capital C A, that was related to the tidal lag time. The parameters that actually enter your gravitational waveform are some effective combinations of these two um, love numbers of body A and body B. And uh, the waveform with Justin showed has a schematic form where I've only kept the Newtonian pieces. So you have a point particle term, you have the dissipation term that enters at 4, 4 pn, and then you have um, the usual adiabatic love number effect that enters at 5 pn. So to, to see how, if you could measure this dissipative uh, tidal deformity, we carried out a Fisher analysis. So I'll just briefly describe the results of that analysis. So in the Fourier domain, you have, uh, we just took a Taylor F2 waveform, and then we have the Cartesian wave phase. For the point particle term, we kept until 4.5 pn term that was recently computed. And then we have the usual uh, adiabatic tidal love number term, and then the dissipative tidal love uh, number phase. The parameter space now is expanded. So you have uh, the usual total mass, the symmetric mass ratio, and then you have the adiabatic tidal deformity and then the dissipative tidal deformity. And then you have um, the coalescence time and phase and then the amplitude. To see if you, how the measurability of uh, capital CA changes with uh, tau d, we injected parameters with GW170817 like parameters uh, into the Fisher analysis, but we took the detector to be 05 and fixed the SNR to be 100. So, as you can see from the results, um, around if the tidal lag time scale is around 20 microseconds, then you can start to measure uh, the dissipative tidal deformability. The, I guess, one other uh, aspect is because of the enhancement of your parameter space you see that uh, your ability to measure the adiabatic love number changes and then uh, it becomes slightly worse. And this is not surprising because we have enhanced the parameter space with a new parameter. Okay, so now if you have a measurement of the tidal lag time scale, the question is how do you map that into microphysics? Um, Justin talks, talked about some processes of uh, some microscopic processes that could be important. So the usual way you parameterize this, um, you parameterize the tidal lag time scale is uh, you say that it's proportional to the viscous uh, kinematic viscosity of the star, uh, and then times the radius of the star divided by the mass. So P two A here is a dimensionless constant, and uh, there are there haven't been any calculations of P two A for uh, relativistic neutron stars. Uh, what we did was we chose P2A to be 10. So there is one calculation uh, where uh, 
P2A has been calculated for incompressible fluids in Newtonian gravity, and then the value for P2A is around 10 for that model. So if you pick this model and then you map the constraint on tau d to the kinematic viscosity, assuming you know you have uh, uh, good measurements of the radius and mass, you can see that uh, you can measure the tire dissipative tidal deformity if the visco kinematic viscosity is of the order of 10 power 14 centimeters per squ square per second. Uh, Justin briefly mentioned different possible mechanisms. So the mechanisms are mostly due to anomalous sources. Molecule viscosity is too small to uh, actually take values such as 10 power 14 uh, centimeters square per second, but bulk viscosity due to ARCA processes can take much larger values than this. Um, shear viscosity due to melting of the crust can also take values much larger than 10 power 14. And then uh, you could also have turbulent viscosities, which I'll briefly talk about in the following slides. But of course, you know, the model we chose here is very simplistic, but you need to do a lot more work to actually map uh, the tidal lag time scale to the microscopic physics. So the question is, what is the value of this dimensionless constant P to A for astrophysical objects? Uh, for Newtonian stars, this has been studied uh, very well. So in Newtonian stars, the tidal response formula is just, you know, the full uh, quadrupole moment just reduces to the multipole moment YLM, I ILM, and then you have uh, the tidal response is called KLM, and then ELM is just the imposed, uh, uh, imposed field. There's extensive literature on uh, how you the properties of KLM for main sequence stars. And um, the imaginary part of the response function is, to, is responsible for dissipation and tidal locking. So the, ex, um, the theory that is currently well established is called Zahn's theory of tidal friction. And then uh, Zahn's theory says that for stars with convective core or convective envelope, the dominant mechanism is due to tur turbulent dissipation or in, the in the convective core or envelope. And uh, this has been studied very well. Just to give you a sense of the numbers that uh, the tidal lag time scale and the viscosity takes for normal stars. Um, again, so you expand the response function in small frequencies. And Justin also talked about this. So uh, when the frequency is zero, you just have the adiabatic love number or the epicycle constant. And then at linear order and frequency, you get the tidal lag time. Uh, for stars with convective envelopes, uh, a simple scaling law is as follows. So you have um, the tidal lag time scale is uh, proportional. Uh, the log of the tidal lag time scale is proportional to the luminosity of the star divided by uh, times the mass envelope squared times radius to the power seven times the mass power six. And it typically takes values of uh, around 10 power minus three seconds. The viscosity for, again, you can map this using the formula I showed before, and then you get the viscosity is around 10 power 15 centimeters square per second. Uh, this is for uh, main sequence stars with a convective envelope. Uh, of course, this is a very simplified uh, scaling law. The response is much more complicated than this. And uh, here I show like a sample plot from this review article. You see that the imaginary part of the response function of L equals two response function as a function of frequency. Um, you see that uh, so these different plots show you different viscosity profiles that the authors chose to present. And then you see that depending on the uh, response, uh, different viscosity profiles, the response function varies uh, uh, significantly. Now, there was a question about black holes. So tidal response for black holes has also been calculated in low frequency regime. Um, because the black holes have no love numbers, the the first term vanishes, and then you just have the dissipative term. And the dissipative term uh, is scales with the mass, as it was mentioned. And you know, for a 20 solar mass black hole, it's of the order of 10 power minus six seconds. So as the black holes get bigger, you get more tidal enhancement. And it also makes sense because the bigger the black hole is, the, the more easier it is to deform. But for ground-based detectors, this value is uh, too small to measure because uh, if the black hole mass is larger, then they quickly merge, and then you cannot really, uh, ha you don't really have enough cycles to actually put constraints, or you know, inco you don't need to incorporate this, incorporate this in your waveform. Okay, so now let me briefly talk about tidal response of neutron stars. So 
if you'd like to model neutron stars properly and then incorporate effects of viscosity in a neutron star, you should model it as a relativistic fluid, which has viscous effects um, in its SNG tensor. Uh, to do this, you have to first come up with a way to describe viscous fluids in relativity in a causal and well-posed manner. And then after you can do that, uh, you should study the response of neutron stars within this relativistic viscous fluid theory to incoming gravitational waves. Um, work in both of these areas um, has not been, uh, it's, it's still in its infancy, so re describing relativistic viscous fluids in a causal manner is only uh, briefly taking shapes because of, you know, the pro mathematical properties of viscous fluids in relativity have to be carefully analyzed. And studies uh, which study the full neutron stars analytically in, to incoming gravitational waves have not been uh, done. There are a few works, but there hasn't been like uh, as many works as done in Newtonian gravity. So what we chose to do as a first step was, um, you know, model the neutron stars within Newtonian gravity using Navier-Stokes theory. So Navier-Stokes theory is the most successful Newtonian theory or classical theory with um, uh, viscous effects. So just to briefly summarize the Navier-Stokes system. So you're assuming the neutron star is cold, so there's no internal energy. So you can ignore the internal energy equation. You have the continuity equation, and then you have the Euler equation, but the Euler equation is corrected through uh, the bulk viscosity, the shear viscosity, and then you have the gravitational potential of the star, and then you have a tidal field. Um, the, uh, you also have the Poisson equation, which just describes the gravity of the star. Um, you could also make the system more complicated by adding things like heating effects, uh, you know, radiative damping. This is usually done in Newtonian gravity for normal stars, but we didn't do that for Newtonian neutron stars. The system is much more complicated than just a perfect fluid model because a viscous fluid obeys different boundary conditions than a new, uh, normal perfect fluid star. So that leads to technical challenges that have to be carefully taken into account. Yeah, the strategy of attack that we chose to do was, you know, you just solve the system of equations numerically, you give it proper boundary conditions and then get the profile of viscosity, um, given a profile of viscosity and then get the tidal response. Uh, instead of presenting the numerical method, I'll just present a very formal solution technique, which is um, well known in uh, Newtonian gravity. So the perfect fluid modes are, you know, a set of complete functions. You have the FP and G modes. So you expand the modes of um, your problem into perfect fluid solutions, sorry, perfect fluid modes, and then you can actually turn the matrix, the problem into a matrix problem with this, and um, you can so invert the matrix and then solve the problem. This is, again, widely used in uh, understanding the interactions of perfect fluids within Newtonian gravity, so this is not, not a new technique. Uh, again, I mentioned this as a formal solution because of the boundary conditions. The solutions can fail at the boundaries if you have shocks. So it's a formal solution, but it's uh, it's good enough inside the star. Uh, just to briefly summarize the qualitative features. So I define a dimensionless frequency and then uh, capital omega N here is the frequency of FP or G modes. Uh, I also define an average kinematic viscosity and then you have uh, a causal viscosity bound that's of the order of 10 past 16 centimeters square per second for uh, neutron stars. And Bill Sin and Cutler noted that it had the viscosity to tidally lock must be much larger than this value. So uh, you do the calculation and then you find that the real part of the response function takes this form. This, this has been presented uh, in many parts in literature. So um, the dynamical conservative tides, you see that the resonance is at uh, when the, the forcing frequency is equal to the oscillation frequency of the star. And then this has been studied recently uh, with, within the so-called dynamical tides. Uh, the imaginary part, on the other hand, contains a viscous contribution. So you see that the imaginary part is proportional to the viscosity, and then it has the same structure where it has resonances uh, close to the when the first thing frequency is the oscillation frequency. Uh, some general observations can be noted uh, using this. So shear viscosity is the dominating factor to the imaginary part of the response function. Bulk viscosity can also contribute uh, if its values are particularly large. So 
the future work we are doing is to calculate uh, that are the lag time scale as a function of viscosities. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, you know, this pretty part of the tidal response has to be. Abhishek, can I just yeah. ask you to just flesh your conclusions and then yeah. we can, uh, we should move on. Yeah, sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. Again, I just want to give people the adequate time to ask questions. Yeah, no uh, let me open up the floor uh, for any questions or comments. Jan, go ahead. Hi, Abhishek. Uh, thank you for the lecture. So uh, you were talking about Navier-Stokes equations, so about, about hyperbolic equations. So they are, they are uh, they contain the shock waves. So I I don't see. I mean, just a very general question. I mean, uh, for what phenomenologically is the shock wave in a neutron star? I I don't understand uh, what you what you mean by this, or uh, uh, what are what is the role of shocks uh, shocks there? Okay, so maybe I can go back here. Uh, so what I wanted to say was, uh, you see, Navier-Stokes or fluid equations in general give rise to shocks. And uh, what I wanted to say was, if you're in the low frequency regime, you probably do not have shocks and you don't have to worry about shocks. But if you'd like to trust this formula that I presented to high frequencies, then you have to be careful because you can develop shocks and you cannot expand smoothly in modes anymore. So it's just the technical aspect that I mentioned. So uh, that's all. If the frequency is large, then there can be shocks in your system. Okay, thank you. Gonzalo, go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you for the nice talk. It was very interesting. My question is on the Fisher analysis that you did. Um, so you only take into account the um, 4 p.m. term, well, the 4 p.m. logarithmic term and the 5 p.m. terms, but the, and the leading term, but isn't this a bit naive? So I expect like this 4 p.m. term will have a lot of gener degeneracies with the 3 p.m., 3.5 p.m., like, um, how much do you expect your results to change if you include all of the physics in the in spiral, so all of the PN terms? Hey, by, by the, the 3 PN term, do you mean the point particle terms? Well, what I mean is that um, here you are uh, ignoring all of the facing terms that appear just from normal general relativity. So no, usually... no, we keep that. Uh, the point particle term is kept until 4.5 PN. Mm, so you take into account all of the post-Newtonian Yes, yes, terms. yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the waveform that was presented here was just the Newtonian pieces, you know, the point particle term is kept to the Newtonian order and then the dissipation term is kept to the, uh, for, at the 4 p.m. New, leading Newtonian order. But in our analysis, we kept all the other terms. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much. I, yeah. I was confused by this. Thank you. Ashkar? Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. So you said that uh, we can uh, detect this dissipative tidal deformability if it is greater than 10 to the 14, but isn't it too high? I mean, uh, the, uh, I mean, the nuclear physics calculations suggest that uh, the viscosity inside the neutron star should be order of 10 to the 8 or something. Yeah, so those calculations are microscopic viscosities. Uh, so I, I I don't see I mean I haven't seen any study so far which suggests uh, which can suggest that amount of high high viscosity. So unless something exotic happens at the neutron star, probably we shouldn't expect to have that much high viscosity. That's my concern. Yeah. So even for normal stars, right? As I showed here, I mean, the this value is much larger. It's ten times larger than ten power fourteen. So for normal stars, too, the molecular viscosities are very small. But the viscosity due to dynamical processes like turbulence, et cetera, are much larger. And then that's what you could potentially see in neutron stars as well. But how larger it could be? For example, the causality con condition you said, mm -hmm. it can give maximum up to 10 to the 16 or something. So you yeah. have a small window uh, which is available. So okay. that causality condition, again, has to be interpreted with caution because that's the average viscosity over the entire star. You could have like really strong viscosities near the surface, and then that could enhance your uh, values of the tidal lag time scale. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, I think uh, I mean uh, we need more calculation in a, yeah, in this of video. course. Yeah, so, I mean uh, just to mention the bulk of cost due to ARCA processes are much larger than this. You can look at the papers by Elias Most. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's thank all the speakers in this block. And uh, we're now going to go to a quick break. I'd be happy to facilitate ongoing discussion uh, during this break. Uh, I do ask, in order to you know, avoid going into complete mayhem, that you do raise your hand uh, if you want to say something. And then I'll give you the floor. Uh, for those who want to take a quick break, we're coming back at 10 past 3 UTC. Okay, I don't know whether people are still here or not, if they're going away, but I just wanted to ask uh, Justin and Abhishek, uh, have, you, have you looked at these dissipative terms in, uh, in comparison to the NR simulations uh, and, hmm. and to get a feel for how important these are and also where in parameter space you're expecting these dissipative terms to really be measurable or at least be relevant? Um, so I guess maybe I'll start with the numerical relativity simulations. Um, uh, as, as Avi mentioned, there's this issue of causality and stability of relativistic viscous fluids. And um, so there haven't really been uh, any sort of, I guess would, I'd say self-consistent relativistic in our simulations of neutron stars, but they do these sort of like what Helios most does is he does perfect fluid simulations. And then you can sort of even ask, given this, this result, how, how big gradients are. And then say, well, what's the temperature of the fluid? Okay, I'll, I'll have some estimate for like the IRCA processes, which give these enormous values of viscosity. And then, um, so I would say mapping it to what we have isn't, there isn't quite a direct mapping yet because we're looking at, I think we have to include it you need the response of the viscosity of the gravitational field. So you can't just uh, uh, use perfect fluid simulations. But, but they are non-perfect fluid simulations, right? Oh, you mean like with, so like none that we would um, feel confident in matching to. Because if the non-perfect fluid simulations are using, um, I think they're using these Israel Stewart type formalisms that we're not entirely sure in those formalisms what's caused by quote fixing the equations versus the physical viscosity. Um, so we we wouldn't feel confident uh, to uh, compare to those types of simulations. Okay. And the dissipation can also be just due to gravitational waves by itself, and then that mm -hmm. we can do using you know if you look at the perfect fluid numerical simulations. And the damping time for gravitation waves, I, and I don't know at the top of my head, but it's probably not much smaller than 10, uh, 20 microseconds. Interesting stuff. Okay, uh, welcome back everybody to the session. We're going to switch gears a little bit and going to look at the um, R mode searches to infer the uh, neutral star properties. And so we have Suprovu from Ayuka, and he's going to talk about the universal relationships to measure neutron star properties from targeted R mode searches. Suprovu, whenever you're ready, go for it. Yeah. Thanks. So, hi everybody. So, today I'm going to talk about universal relation or to measure neutron star properties from targeted R mode searches. I'm currently a doctoral student working with Professor Devarati Jagarji at Ayuka. And this work, part of the work was done also with Dhruv Patak, who is a postdoctoral fellow here, and Professor Devarati Jagarji. So, as in the past talks we have heard, so neutron star, so mostly people and we also in the LIGO, we have detected still now binary neutron star mergers. But there is also another important kind of gravitational wave sources from neutron stars, which we call as a continuous gravitational wave sources. So generally, they are different because the binary mergers are generally transient signal. So they, they spend very few time in the LIGO band, so depending on their mass. 
And instead, these continuous gravitational waves are like persistent signals. So depending on their nature, they can stay on for the years. They can emit gravitational waves throughout the years. And but their amplitude is generally very low. So you generally stack up your signal to, over the observation time and to increase the SNR. So still now there is not a not any evidence for continuous gravitational wave searches, but still with the more observation time, we are improving our search limits also. So generally, there are mostly two sources of continuous gravitational wave from neutron star. One is called the ellipticity-based searches, or the is some kind of deformation is there in, on the neutron star surface. It can happen due to magnetic field or some crustal failure. So this can emit gravitational wave because of this axisymmetric, stru axisymmetric structure. The other uh, source of continuous gravitational wave is the R modes. So there are many oscillation modes of the fluid in the neutron star. So R mode is particularly interesting because it is present in the all rotating star. And it is particularly interesting because it is generally driven unstable due to a mechanism called Chandrasekhar Friedman Schultz mechanism. And because of the frame dragging effect and their frequency, so they generally become unstable in all rotating star. But as you said, as you also heard in the last talk, so there will be any dissipation mechanism inside the neutron star. And there is always the interplay between these dissipation mechanisms and the R mode instability. So this gives a very narrow band in the neutron star temperature and rotation period where this neutron star can actually emit this gravitational wave via R mode. So generally young pulsars, so those are born hot and very highly spin rotating. So those are thought to be spin down by this R mode mechanism. So in the LIGO, uh, using the LIGO data, so there has been searches for this uh, R, mode oscill R mode oscillation from this particularly two target pulsar, target, two targeted pulsar. One is the crab pulsar because it is also young and it is very uh, spinning down very fast. And another is this particular pulsar PSR J0537. So with the breaking index between its two glitches is near equals to seven. So breaking index gives you the idea that what is the main spinning down mechanism of the neutron star. So it is a normal pulsar. So generally breaking index is near equals to three. And if it is R mode, so it is near equals to seven. So in the left hand figure, we show the latest result from the O3. You can see what we call a spin down limits. So it is if you're all spin down energy is going by R mode. So this you can so this you can see the strain amplitude is almost at the level of 10 to the minus 26. And the current search upper limits, so these are also probing at the level of your spin down range. And the more data we have with the more observation runs, so these limits are thought to be improved, even if not a detection. So now let's look at the R mode frequency and the universal relations. So R mode frequency, generally the ellipticity based searches are generally twice the rotational frequency where the gravitational wave emission is happening. But for this R mode, if you consider Newtonian limit, it is the L equals to 2 equals to L equals to M equals to 2 mode is generally 2 by 3 or the old gravitational wave frame, it will be 4 by 3. But there will be correction due to GR and rapid rotation with this parameter takes into account A and B. And this A parameter that determines the GR correction. So this can you determine from this kappa. So it will be twice minus kappa. And it was earlier shown that is by Idrissi et al. that this has a universal relation with neutron star compactness. And this determined actually at which range you want to search for, for this particular targeted pulsar. So in our last words, we improved upon this universal relation based on two considerations. So one, so we have now a much shorter, much narrow uh, uncertain in the equation of state because now we have the GW170879 Niger observation. So that has constant your equation of state and the particularly the radius to a very narrow level, almost 5 to 10 percent. And also, we also wanted to match the Newtonian limit. So here I have shown the Newtonian limit and your compactness going to zero should have been matched to the Newtonian limit 2 by 3. So considering these two uh, considerations, so we, we improved this universal relations. And this in improved universal relation, they gave a higher range for these searches currently. The PSR J0537 earlier was 86 to 97, but if you use this universal relation, it becomes say two hertz higher, so it becomes 86 to 99. Also, you can get the universal relation of this R mode frequency with the dimensionless tidal deformability. So this kind of universal relations are used to measure the estimate about the dynamical tidal effect from R mode excitation. As the neutron, so in the binary structures, when the neutron star is in spiraling, so because of this tidal interaction, many modes can excite. And this R modes that's coupled to the gravitomagnetic part of the tidal field, 
that can also be excited. And people have recently shown, many works have recently shown that this kind of effect will be very important in the case of 3G detectors. So in those kind of study, you can also use this kind of universal lesson where R mode frequency is related to the dimensionless tidal deformation. So now today, now in this work, I will talk about another important property about, about the continuous gravitational wave. So generally we say the distance of this, these binary mergers are said to be standard silence, means you can directly get the distance of this uh, merger from the gravitational wave data alone. So from, from a leading order calculation, if you assume your the amplitude, which depends on the chart mass, and from how your because of gravitational wave emission, how this orbital will decay. So you get this f dot information, how this frequency will changing with, of the gravitational wave with time. And if you remove this uh, charge mass parameter, you can directly get the distance. If you can from a detection, if you measure the frequency and frequency derivative with this h naught, so you can directly get the distance. And if you somehow get the location from electromagnetic counterpart, you can also measure the Hubble constant. So that was done for GW170817 also. But the recent study by Sanyuska and Jones showed that the continuous gravitational wave, sorry, continuous gravitational wave emission will not be standard silence. So there you cannot always directly measure the distance. Here I show the example for a R mode surges, but you can also do the similar exercise for ellipticity based continuous gravitational wave emission also. So here, if you see the H naught, the strain amplitude, you can express in terms of the R mode saturation amplitude, which is denoted by alpha and the internal properties. Similarly, if you assume the spin down is happening due to this R mode emission, you can also get a F dot information how the frequency is changing. And then if you remove this parameter alpha MRQJ uncertain parameter, so you can get a similar expression. But you can see here you do not get a direct distance. So you get a combination of distance and the moment of inertia. So even if you from a detection, you can measure F, F dot and H naught, you will not be able to get the directly the distance. So will combination with moment of inertia and distance. So distance estimation will always be degenerate with the moment of inertia. Now, because we have this advantage for this R mode scenarios, because R mode frequency has a particular universal relation. So here I saw how can how you can break this degeneracy with the universal relation. So suppose we are doing a targeted search. Targeted search in continuous gravitational wave means you know the frequency. So you know at least the frequency of the rotation that the pulsar is rotating. So you guess from this compactness range, the universal relation, where you can actually get the R mode frequency. And from the measure, you, when you actually get the R mode frequency, you can measure the kappa parameter that, as I shown earlier, that has the universal relation. And if you use this universal relation, you can get the compactness and tidal deformability. Now you use another universal relation, which we call as the I love Q relation. So it is a universal relation between moment of inertia, tidal love number, and quadruple moment. So from this tidal deformability, if you use this I love Q, you can get the normalized moment of inertia. And now if you assume a distance, so you can get the mass from the tidal deformability. And now you can get the moment of inertia and directly the distance. So using the universal relation, and if you assume a knowledge of the your Newton star equation of state, in this scenario, you can actually get a distance of the pulsar. Now like, let's look at the other case scenario, because currently the, with the sensitivity and with the targeted searches, from the electromagnetic observation also, uh, we can get the distance of the pulsar. So the particular pulsar we are, that is currently being searched for this R mode scenario, the PSR J0537, so it is in the Large Magellanic Cloud, it is around 40 kilohertz. So you know the distance from the electromagnetic observation. So if you use the prior information of the distance, now you show, now we show how you can constrain your equation of state. So say we have the distance from the electromagnetic observation. So from this H naught, you can directly get the moment of inertia. Now you follow a similar path shown above also. So you get this universal lessons and you can get the normalized moment of inertia and compactness and tidal deformity. And now if you combine this information, you can get the mass of the pulsar. So from there, this of, if you follow this path, here no you, you, equation of state has been used and all the relations are universal. So you can get the mass of the pulsar the dimensional tidal deformity and also the moment of inertia. So from the binary observation still now, we have got the mass and tidal deformity. In similar, we also can obtain from a targeted R mode detection. And you also get the moment of inertia also extra. So the R mode scenario has also a lot of potential to, to put a constant on your dense matter equation of state. Now the last uh, few minutes, I'll show how accurately can you measure this parameter with the current gravitational wave detectors and their sensitivity. So we do a fission matrix kind of analysis. 
and here the in in the gravitational wave phase because we are doing a targeted search and because in also we know the sky localization so you can uh, you can do a simplified form of you can expand your phase in a very simplified form with this say, Taylor expansion in terms of this frequency and higher order derivatives and then you can also calculate the SNR and from this Fisher information matrix you can actually calculate the error in your parameter so I have shown the d by square root i parameter but similarly you can get also your moment of inertia and similarly distance so here I consider a canonical neutron star at a distance of one kilo per se, and I saw the SNR estimates for this two year of observation period with advanced LIGO and ET sensitivity curves. And you can see for this advanced LIGO, you need the almost saturation amplitude to be almost as high as 10 to the minus three to get a almost SNR equals to 20, but you can get a one order of magnitude improve in the ET, so you can go up to as low as 10 to power minus four for a 100 hertz gravitational wave frequency. And similarly, you can get the error estimates. So since the error in the moment of inertia, you can directly calculate from your frequency. So the moment of inertia, you can actually get uh, accuracy of the, with, great, with greater accuracy than the distance. So your moment of inertia can be measured up to 10% accuracy for gravitational wave greater than equals to 100 hertz. So these estimates are shown for ET, again, ET sensitivity with a two, of, two year observation period. And similarly for distance uh, measurement. So if you want to have a 20% error measurement on your distance, so your gravitational frequency needs to be greater than 20 hundred hertz and alpha, the saturation amplitude will be, have to be greater than 10 to the power minus four. And this kind of estimates, because this I have shown for a pulsar at one kpc, so you know the amplitude, the gravitational wave amplitude will fall as one over d. So this also estimates similarly scales if you change the distance. So I will end the talk. We'll I will summarize the overall the talk. So what I have shown is that we can have for this R mode frequency. So we have the universal relation between the R mode frequency and neutron star compactness and also tidal deformability. And these universal relations are updated with the recent multi messenger constant, and they are also consistent with the Newtonian limits. So you can use uh, the universal relation. So one case, if you assume a equation of state, so you can actually break the degeneracy between the distance and the moment of inertia of your continuous gravitational wave observation. But if you assume a prior knowledge of distance from your electromagnetic observation, so you can also put constant on your dense matter equation of state. And we, in future, we plan to extend because we consider a very simplistic signal model. So we want to do a more realistic analysis with a more on the LIGO strain data using a Bayesian formalism and see how much actually we can constrain your neutron star equation of state. So I, I'll finish my talk here. Thanks for listening and love to hear some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suprovo. Uh, let's see. Let's open up the floor for questions. Okay, let me start with a question first then. So if I understand correctly, you're, you're saying that there is a pathway to do uh, distance measurement, right? Yeah. And, and, and so you must be thinking also about H naught and, and, and things. Yeah, so do the you... cosmology... Go ahead. Sorry, you can finish the distance. No, I wanted to ask whether you have a, a sense of, you know, how far you can take this you know. Yeah, so the current with the sensitivity, because I have already shown you here, so with the pulsar even at the one kpc, if you want to have a distance measurement with the 20% accuracy with ET sensitivity, so you can go have to be uh, around 10 to the power. So the, you can get a, for this alpha parameter, the saturation amplitude to be greater than equal to 10 to the power minus four. So this is so similarly, if you assume a say 40 or some kilo per se, so Till now with the sensitivity, we are talking about only galactic pulsars and also the distance are at the KPC level. So you cannot do really cosmological uh, estimates like H not with this KPC, the galactic distance. Okay, but you could possibly yeah. uh, calibrate, right? You yeah, yeah. Cal calibrate electromagnetic measurements. Uh, okay, excellent. Okay, any other questions for Suprovo? Going once, going twice. Okay, well, thank you very much again, thank Suprovo. You. And we can move on uh, with a little bit of extra time. 
And so we're going to switch gears again, uh, instead of now talking about uh, subsolar mass searches. And this is going to be Gonzalo. Let me spotlight Gonzalo right here. Gonzalo, can you start sharing your screen? Okay, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about a paper that I contributed to and which was done by the LIGO, LIGO Virgo and Cagara collaboration and which was on search for subsolar mass black hole binaries in the LIGO Virgo O3 VRAM. So the main motivation to do this search is that LIGO and Virgo are sensitive to the gravitational waves that are emitted during the coalescence of compact binaries containing subsolar mass objects. And therefore, I think that we should look for them and try to see if these objects exist or don't. And it will be interesting to do this because there are no widely accepted astrophysical channels that predict the formation of subsolar mass objects, which are significantly more compact than white dwarfs. Therefore, a detection of such an object would be a smoking gun for new physics. In the literature, there are a lot of non-standard uh, mechanisms proposed that could produce such objects, which include, for example, primordial black holes, which are black holes that form shortly after the Big Bang by the collapse of primordial fluctuations coming from inflation. Then we have dark black holes, which are formed by the collapse of dissipative particle dark matter, and which we will talk more about later. And finally, another example is that of boson stars, which are ultralight bosonic fields clamped together in compact objects, which do not have a horizon. If the mass of the boson is greater than around 10 to the minus 10 electron volts, these objects have to be subsolar. So now I will describe the search that was done by the LDK collaboration in which we analyzed the data of the O3 run between November 1st, 2019 and March 27th, 2020, which corresponds to around 125.5 days of data with two or more detectors operational. For this paper, we use three different match filter pipelines, in particular GSTLAL, MBTA, and PyCBC. This is done to get more robust results and to be able to cross-validate our results between the different pipelines. Uh, just to remind you, match filtering is a search technique in which one compares the data with the templates expected um, from the theory, in this case for gravitational wave signals emitted by a compact binary coalescence with subsolar mass components, and this method allows us to get a very long and faint signals out of the data. This will be very important for subsolar mass binaries because as I, they will be very, very long and they will be very, very faint. So in this formula that I show here, I write the leading post-Newtonian prediction for the duration of the CVC as a function of its shear mass and the frequency from which we start the analysis. So as you can see, it is proportional to the shear mass to the minus five thirds. So as the shear mass decreases and decreases and becomes small, like it's the case for subsolar mass, these uh, durations will become uh, huge. So if we assume an initial frequency of 20 Hertz, uh, like it is usually done in LIGO analysis, these durations can become of the order of minutes to hours. Uh, since subsolar mass searches will have much longer signals, we will need many more templates to fully cover the parameter range that we are studying. And this will lead us to uh, much more computationally costly searches. So to limit this, what we do is we take a, we use the fact that the duration is proportional to the frequency to the minus eight thirds. So we restrict the frequency range in which we are studying this signal. We limit ourselves to the frequency range between 45 and 1024 hertz, which will mean that we will lose up to 9% of the signal to noise ratio. This can be translated into an up to 24% reduction in the surveyed volume. However, this cost will come at a great benefit which uh, is that the search will be sped up by a factor of 20 and will make our search actually computationally feasible, even though it, it will still be much more computationally costly than the standard searches. Okay, so the template bank that we will actually use for our search, it was constructed for the Taylor F2 waveform, which is a frequency wave, uh, it's a frequency domain waveform, which takes into account up to 3.5 post-Newtonian order terms. Uh, this waveform only models the spiral part of the signal, which in our case is justified because these uh, uh, subsolar mass binaries, they merge at such high frequencies that we are not able to observe the merger ring down part. And we are also not able to measure uh, matter effects and distinct between compact objects, which are black holes or a different exotic object. So in particular, the parameter range that we target with this template bank uh, comprises primary masses between 0 0.2 and 10 solar masses. So the primary mass can be super solar. However, the secondary mass is always subsolar, being in the range between 0 0.2 and one solar masses. 
we also limit the mass ratio of the binaries to again decrease the size of the template bank, but also because at very extreme mass ratio, mass, mass ratios, this uh, Taylor F2 waveform starts to be unreliable and we could not trust the results too much. Also, uh, we consider only a line spin, so we ignore the effects of precession. And in the case in which the black holes are uh, have high masses, so larger than 0.5 solar masses, we allow high spins, so spins up to 0.9 uh, in dimensional units. However, when the uh, black holes have small masses, we restrict the spins much more to be smaller than 0.1. As you can see in the plot of the left, we do this to excise this part of the template bank where the number density of templates would be larger and to reduce by a lot the size of our template bank. So the three pipelines that we use, they uh, use the same discrete template bank, which has a minimum match of 0.97 for any signal in the parameter range. What this means is that in this parameter range, due to finite, like, like due to the discreteness of the template bank, we guarantee that we can lose up to 3% of the signal to noise ratio, which this will mean that we can lose up to 10% of the astrophysical signals. Even with all of the, like this 3% is very standard, but even with all of these um, limitations that we have put to make our template bank as small as possible, it will still have a huge number of templates of around 2 million, which is much, much greater than the usual number of templates in standard searches. And the duration of the templates will also be very long, so ranging from 5 seconds to 476 to, to 470 seconds. Okay, so the result of our search is that in the data analyzed, we do not find any a candidate which is significant enough to claim a detection. So the most significant candidate that we find had a false alarm rate of one every five years. This is, however, not enough to claim such a big uh, detection, because if you, for example, go back to the first detection that LIGO made, GW150914, this had a, a false alarm rate of one every 200,000 years. So this lack of detections can be recasted into an upper bound on the merger rate of subsolar mass binaries. To put this upper bound, what we will have to do is we will have to estimate the sensitivity of the search pipelines for binaries in a given population. And this uh, sensitivity is measured by uh, using what we call the survey time volume. So what we do is we multiply T, which is the analyzed time, by an integral over volume of the fraction of astrophysical sources in the population which are detectable at a redshift set. The way that we compute this fraction is in a complete uh, data-driven and direct way. So what we do is we add simulated subsolar mass CBC signals into the data and determine the fraction of signals found by the searches. So for the injections, we do the same injections in all of the pipelines. We uh, do in total 2 million injections spaced 15 seconds apart, and that span all of O3, so both O3 and O3B. We join both of both parts of the third observing run to have better constraints on the merger rates. So the parameters of the injections are randomly sampled from the distributions that I show here, where you can see that the injections are um, sampled from the source uh, masses instead of the detector frame masses as was done for the template bank. And therefore, the ranges in masses are a bit uh, different from that of the template bank. For the spins, we assume that they are isotropically distributed and limit their magnitude to be smaller than 0.1. And finally, in the location, we inject them uniform in common, in common volume and up to a redshift of 0.2, which is much, much larger than anything we could expect to see with our pipeline. So this uh, will be too far to observe. The, what we observe is that the search sensitivity is primarily a function of chirma. So in the results that I'm going to show you, uh, we're going to plot the um, upper limits on the merger rates as a function of chirma. And what we will do for the actual plots is we break the population into nine equally spaced pins in the range between 0.6 and 2.72 solar masses. With these uh, VTs, we compute the 90% confidence interval upper limit on the merger rate for each bin, which using the loudest event statistic within the frequencies framework is just given by 2.3 over the VT. So the actual upper limits on the merger rates are uh, shown in this plot, uh, where you can see, first of all, that if you compare the different pipelines, they generally agree with each other, having differences of around 30%, which is very reasonable when you take into account how different and complex these pipelines are. And to translate these uh, upper limits on the major rates into something more familiar, what we see, what we can see is that the range of the search goes from 40 megaparsecs in the least sensitive part, which is at low masses, to 180 megaparsecs in the 
most sensitive part, which is in here, depending on the chismas. And in these uh, ranges, we find no significant candidate in the 275.3 days of data analysis. So you can see here that this has a monotonous um, behavior, but in the last bin, we have a worst uh, performance. And the reason for this is that some of the um, um, injections are being redshifted away from the template bank. And if the injection is outside of the template bank, we cannot recover it. Okay. So we can use these upper limits on the merger rates to put constraints on any model that predicts a sizable amount of subsolar mass mergers. In particular, first of all, we constrain primordial black hole models. And for any primordial black hole model, we will, able, we will be able to exclude any of the model parameters that predict subsolar mass merger rates larger than the upper limit set by the search. So we will focus on a simple model, which is usually used to put constraints on the fraction of dark matter in the form of PBHs, which is uh, FPBH. And in this model, PBHs are produced at a single mass and are randomly distributed in space. We will also consider two different binary formation scenarios. First of all, we will consider early binaries, which is the most popular scenario in the literature, because it's expected to dominate the um, binaries that will merge in, in the like nowadays. So uh, in this uh, framework, uh, binaries are formed in the very early universe. And the way we model the binary formation is by considering the two nearest neighbors, which are gravitationally bounded. And we assume that they are torqued by the next closest black hole, making them a binary. So for the first time in this model, we also include a very important suppression factor to the merger rate that effectively takes into account primordial black hole binary disruption. So this, for example, happens when you have a binary of black holes which are orbiting each other and are going to merge, but a third black hole passes by and breaks the binary and we never are able to see this merger in LIGO. So the second scenario that we consider and which is expected to be subdominant is that of late binaries in which uh, the binaries are formed dynamically inside primordial black hole clusters. These clusters are assumed to be seeded by Poisson fluctuations in the initial primordial black hole separation because primordial black holes are randomly distributed in space within this model. So finally, in this slide, I show the, um, the constraints on FPBH for the different um, things that I have mentioned. And the most important ones are the ones for early binaries because it's the ones that are uh, most studied in the literature. And for the first time, for this case, gravitational, wave strong, gravitational waves strongly disfavor single mass primordial black hole models, making the totality of dark matter in this mass range, even including binary disruption effects. So for example, here we have plotted uh, the O2 constraint when we uh, include this F sub, where you can see that it's uh, unconstraining because uh, Usually, FPVH has to be smaller than one. However, um, this, F, this suppression factor is very important because this uh, here below are the O2 constraints without including it. So, however, what we have to take into account is that these limits are not universal. Different primordial black hole models would predict different subsolar mass merger rates as a function of FPVH. And in fact, if we allow for broad PBH mass distributions, we still cannot uh, rule out FPVH equals to one. And then in the blue, we show the constraints for late binaries. And here we find no significant limits because, as I mentioned before, the merger rates from late binaries are expected to be much, much smaller. OK, so the second and last model that we constrain using the results of our search is that of dark matter black holes. In this model, we assume that dark matter is uh, formed by two fermions that interact via a dark photon. And this interaction will be very important because it will allow for the cooling and the collapse of the dark matter into black holes. Since our dark matter is made out of fermions, uh, similarly to what happens for neutron stars with the, no, sorry, with a white dwarfs with the Ch Chandrasekhar limit, our um, dark black holes will have a minimum mass, which will be a function of the mass of the fermions and the strength of the interaction. So to constrain the fraction of dark matter in these DBHs, which we call FDBH, we will take a Bayesian approach because it will depend on many more parameters than that of the mass and the fraction. So the ones that we marginalize over is the slope of the initial DBH mass function and the maximum mass of the DBHs. We make further assumptions that uh, the DBHs are formed between a ratio of 20 and 30, and then the fraction of DBHs that are in binaries is similar to that of population three stars. So a fraction in binaries of around 0 0.26. If here I show the constraints of FDBH as a function of the minimum mass, which we said is the similar to the Chandrasekhar limit, and you can see that the constraints are a factor of two better than in O3A. 
in O3. And the best constraint is at a mass of a, um, at a minimum mass of one, where we have to have that FDBH is smaller than 1.2 times 10 to the minus five. Okay, so just to conclude, I will summarize the most important thing. So we have made a search for CVCs with a subsolar mass component mass of between 0, 0 0.2 solar masses and one solar mass. Uh, in this search, no candidate significant enough to claim a detection was found. This lack of, this lack of detec detections can be recasted into upper bounds on the merger rates of binaries with subsolar mass components. And the upper, these upper bounds uh, on the merger rates can themselves be translated into constraints of any model predicting these mergers. In particular, we consider two different models. First of all, we consider PBH, P, uh, primordial black holes. And in this case, for the first time, gravitational waves uh, constraints strongly disfavor single mass PBH models making the totality of dark matter in this mass range, even including binary disruption effects. And the second, the second model that we consider is that of dark matter black holes, where we get, we get a factor of two improvement constraints from respect of O3A. And this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Let's see. Are there any questions for Gonzalo? Okay, let me let me uh, start off by asking a question. So you're talking about dark matter black holes. Yes. Right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> how? What is the formation mechanism for these for these objects? Or are they really purely uh, static objects that you assume? I mean, the point is that uh, when you have dark matter which doesn't interact with itself, it cannot form very compact structure because it doesn't have a way to dissipate energy and for sort of molecular clouds to collapse uh, via the genes mechanism and so on. If you add a... Um, if you add an interaction in the dark matter, these uh, clouds can radiate energy via photons, so light, and they can effectively cool and collapse to form a black hole. So it's the same way that stars are formed. But you assume that it's uh, in the dark matter sector. Right, but they are, they are then still just black holes. Yes, they are black holes. So it's really just a possible formation mechanism Yes, I mean, the thing is that uh, in real astrophysics, we don't get black holes which are below a solar mass because we have the chandra sekar limit. And then the, um, the limit, the TOV, TOV uh, limit for neutron stars and so on. But here, since the mass of the fermions and the strength of the interaction is a bit more unbounded, to say it somehow, we can get subsolar mass black holes. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure it's, you, you're, you're purely talking about a formation channel rather than a new type of black hole. Exactly. So it's just a yeah. formation channel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you're saying that the, there's about a 30% difference between the search pipelines. Yeah. Um, that seems quite substantial to me. I know you're saying that this is, you know, acceptable, understandable, but, you know, 30%, if you think about it in terms of total volume, that, that's a lot, right? So do you have a sense of where this, this difference really is? And is there any ongoing work to, you know, make that, make that difference smaller? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of work in the collaboration to continuously evolve the pipelines and improve them and make them to agree. However, the problem is that um, real gravitational wave detector data has a lot of complications. So non-Gaussianities, glitches, and just like these pipelines are incredibly complex and they are written separately and treat the, like treat everything almost differently. So each of them does so many different steps that getting like uh, getting them to agree is, uh, is hard. So there are a lot of differences between pipelines. I don't know if this answers your question or not. I mean, I know there's no actual you know answer, but I was just curious whether uh, there was thought of trying to move them closer together 
or even you know not take the hit of the trials factor and and use fewer pipelines but we can have this discussion uh, uh, some other time as well okay. because there is another question by Swarnim go ahead yeah hi I had this just follow up question on this dark matter black holes. So you have considered it as an another formation channel for subsolar mass black holes. So yeah, so uh, so I understand that essentially they're just black holes, which is the formation channel that you discussed here. So is there any way you're dis distinguishing it from the other channel? Like you also discussed primordial black holes. So is there any difference that you're uh, assuming in this model, or that everything is same for both of them? Uh, well, I mean, here what we assume is that all of the dark matter is in the form of this um, interacting dark matter. However, only a small fraction of it will collapse. So this uh, thing is obtained doing Bayesian posterior, like this is the fraction of a uh, dark matter in dark matter black holes but which depends a lot of things. So like the collapse and so on, for example, would depend on the strength of the interaction, which will also enter in the minimum mass. Uh, so I think both of them are black holes, as you mentioned, uh, but the fractions that we derive really come from the assumptions of each model, because really the formation channels um, and the not only the formation channels, but also the binary form like the way they merge and they form binaries and so on they change a lot so even within primordial black holes if you assume a early binary formation early binary formation predicts very high merger rates so you can constrain fpvh very well however if you assume still within primordial black holes a late binary formation which predicts very small uh, merger rates since we do not expect to see them in LIGO we cannot Constrain them, constrain them. I don't know if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. There are different models. That. They predict different major yeah, rates just, for the same objects. You just clarify what is this F uh, DBH basically? What fraction are you talking about exactly here? Yeah. Sir, could you repeat your question? You so what it. exactly is F DBH? What fraction are you talking about here? I didn't follow. So so yeah. F DBH. So here we assume that all of the dark matter is interacting dark matter. Yeah. And FDBH is the fraction of this dark matter that is in the form of black. Okay. 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 The fraction of the total dark matter in the universe you're talking. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. In the form of black holes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh let's thank Gonzalo again. And we have to move on. Uh, and we're gonna have another talk related to subsolar mass. I believe this is Jose. Jose, let me spotlight you. In the meantime, please share your screen. Great. Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay. And so, um, yes, so we now have uh, Jose talk about analysis of a subsolar mass compact binary candidate from the second observing run of Advanced LIGO. Jose, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Okay, thank you very much. So hi everyone, I'm Jose Francisco, a second year PhD student from Madrid. And today we'll be talking about a piece of work that I did in collaboration with the people listed in this slide. And the title reads, Parameter Estimation of the Most Significant Subsolar Mass Candidate in O2. And it's quite self-explanatory. So we performed a PE analysis of a candidate with a subsolar mass component identified in the second observing run of the LIGO Virgo interferometer. Okay. So first, why did we do it? Well, it was interesting in itself to get one of the candidates uh, reported by a subsolar mass gravitational wave search and do some more involved analysis on it. Also, as we really don't know everything that exists out there in the cosmos, it is good to train ourselves with a region of the parameter space that is quite challenging from the, uh, for the standards analysis due to computational limitations. Indeed, the subsolar mass region represents one of the most promising places to look for new physics. And so uh, this work serves as a proof of readiness from our side. So now let's dive into the specifics of the search and the candidate. It is important to mention that it was not an official LBK subsolar mass search, but one performed independently by some members of the collaboration that extended the parameter space to more extreme mass ratios using the data from the second observing run. 
So we took uh, the multiple detector trigger with the lowest false alarm rate and performed some parameter estimation around the time of the trigger provided by the search. This kind of analysis presents some improvement in the description of the candidate when compared to the information given by the search, as we get to characterize the posterior distribution of the parameters. So <clears throat> for that matter, we use uh, two phenomenological waveforms, IMR phenom XPHM and IMR phenom PV2, which represents a refinement in the modeling of the underlying physics when compared to Taylor F2, which is the one that is employed by the search. Uh, then mm, we decrease the low frequency cutoff from 45 Hertz as used by the search to 20 Hertz, which is equivalent to taking 128 seconds of strain data to analyze. And finally, we thoroughly assessed the cleanness of the used data, which led to the identification and subtraction of a significant glitch in the strain. In the table that is taken from the paper, uh, we are, where the search was reported, the four most significant triggers are shown, and we highlight the one where we did our analysis. So we can perform now a quick statistical exercise to understand the significance of the candidate. First, using the false alarm rate of the search, we can directly obtain a false alarm probability. That is the probability that the search will produce a higher ranked candidate over data containing only noise, which has this expression. And then uh, using an observation time of 118 days, we obtain that 12% of the trials will indeed give rise to a higher candidate a high rank candidate, which is non-negligible. So now uh, a similar exercise can be done with the rate of events obtained from by the subsolar mass searches performed during the set of semi run. Uh, the procedure and the outcome of the last of these searches have been very nicely described in the talk before this one by my colleague Gonzalo. So here we will use the results taking into account the whole outro run. This is another completely different way of understanding the statistical significance of our candidate and is based on the Bayesian nature of the searches and the results. Which <clears throat> we try to answer the question, given the non-detection of any subsolar mass CBC during O3, what is the probability that this candidate is a real signal coming from a CBC merger with a subsolar mass component? So more specifically, taking the 90% confidence levels for both the uh, merger rate and the volume time surveyed, we can estimate an upper bound for this probability. Making use of the fact that the gravitational waves arriving at the detector follow a Poisson distribution as a phenomena <clears throat> in nature, with the parameter mu written here, the probability of finding any events will be given by this. And the probability for the search to have found one or more events will be smaller than 0 0.45. This helps us put into context our candidate, as we see it cannot really be really ruled out, or, nor it can be confirmed. So from now on, we will always work under the hypothesis that our candidate is a true gravitational wave signal coming from a CBC. However, I want you to keep in mind that we are not saying by any means that this candidate is real. Uh, it probably is not. We don't know. So now, onto the candidate itself. As we have said, it has the lowest far and a certain mass of 1.57 solar masses. Expected time for such a trigger in the detector sensitivity band from 30 Hertz is uh, around 104 seconds. Thus, we will use 128 seconds of Livingston and Hanford data, which were the detector available at the time. So now for that shear mass, we require the mass ratio to be less than 0.28 for the secondary component to be subsolar. We thus need a good characterization of the parameters and a strict convergence criteria for our runs. So now talking about the priors, we use the standard ones for the binary black hole candidates, that is uniform in component masses and in commoving volume. And before discussing the results, the piece, and we will describe a glitch and find in the stream. So we found a non-Gaussian transient, usually denominated a bleak glitch due to its morphology, for 10 seconds before coalescing. Luckily for us, it should not have affected the candidate detection by the search as the template of the trigger was 12 seconds long. However, for our purposes, it was mandatory to the glitch this train. So now, the cleaning phase. In the first picture, we show the spectrogram centered at the time of the glitch, that is 14 seconds before trigger time. We can argue based on the normalized energy color bar that this could be a significant transient that needs to be removed to get an unbiased parameter estimation. As is customary, <clears throat> we use bias wave as the only tool for glitch subtraction. Using its clean only option, we fit it for the incoherent part 
of the signal, that is the part that is only located in one of the detector. <clears throat> we studied a window of four seconds around the time of the maximum energy for the glitch. And with the usual wavelet prior, which is just a sum of wavelets, we perform the fit to our model. So in this second picture, we plot in blue the original whiteness strain in the time domain, where the glitch now is easily noticeable. After performing the cleaning phase with bias wave, we obtain a glitch model, the green line. The final clean data that will be used for the PE analysis is shown in orange, where deviations from Gaussianity are small. This is just uh, subtracting one in the, in the blue from the green, so the green from the blue. Sorry. So this can be further appreciated in the clean spectrogram of the last picture, as the normalized energy reaches a very small number, which basically means there's no excess power at all in the strain. So now we made use of Lal inference MCMC as the sampler of choice. And we employ, the, as I've already mentioned, the frequency domain waveforms IMR phenom XPHM and IMR phenom PV2. Both include the effects of precession, and the former also include or, uh, higher order modes. So the SNR that we find has a median value close to eight. And now, in order to obtain a posterior, we also need to estimate the PSD around the time of the event, that is to characterize the noise. And we use for this matter bias wave again. So we have now described the full setup and we can get to see the posterior PDF obtained in the analysis. First, we find a posterior probability of M2 of being subsolar of around 85%, depending on the waveform, but closely agreeing with one another. The first of, <clears throat> of the corner plots is the usual luminosity distance plotted against the inclination angle. We also include the priors at black solid lines in the marginal distribution. The median value for the luminosity distance is 120 megaparts. Now, <clears throat> the second plot shows the primary mass against the secondary mass, both in the source frame. We show the limits separating the subsolar mass and supersolar mass regions of the secondary component. This picture shows that when the posterior distribution is fully characterized, and again, under the hypothesis that this candidate is indeed at CBC, the possibility of the mass of the secondary component being above one solar mass, and thus in the neutron star region is non negligible. So perhaps we are seeing a neutron star so the third of the corner plots shows uh, the posterior for the effective spin parameter. In the vertical axis, we display the effective in spiral spin, which is uh, defined as the mass weighted <clears throat> average uh, spin parallel to the orbital angular momentum. And in the horizontal axis, the effective precession spin parameter, which is related to the in-plane spins uh, of the binary. The priors in both effective parameters are those obtained by setting uniform distributions in the primary and the secondary spin magnitudes, as well as an isotropic prior over the spin orientation. So both remains primarily unconstrained with a very slight preference for small spins. Now, <clears throat> uh, an unusual feature of this candidate, <clears throat> which is the location in the sky. I say it's unusual because of the blob-like shape as shown in this picture. So usually uh, triggers with Livingston and Humphrey detectors only have a ring-like shape because the only parameter that can be used to measure the sky localization is the time delay between these two detectors. We define the time delay as the scalar product of the position vector of Livingston with respect to Humphrey with the direction in the sky of the source, here denoted as N. The shape then becomes a ring unless the cosine is close to the maximum or the minimum, which is the case here, but this is not the usual case. As you can see in the first picture, the time delay is close to maximum, the maximum possible light travel time, which means that it should come almost parallel to the line joining both interferometers. So we can also get different shapes if in the future or right now, like Virgo, Kagra, or any future interferometers also will detect the signal. Now, <clears throat> one last piece of analysis before summarizing the work. So we perform a so-called coherence test. Uh, this test was first proposed by John Veitch and collaborators, and the test tries to quantify using a Bayesian model comparison the hypothesis between the signal being a coherent one in both detectors versus it being incoherent. This is translated into doing uh, the PE analysis again using both detectors simultaneously on one hand or individually <clears throat> and comparing the, uh, the evidence obtained. So we will expect a real gravitational wave signal to favor the coherent hypothesis as it passes through both interferometers, leaving a coherent trace behind. A terrestrial signal should, in most cases, leave an incoherent trace as the detectors are located far apart. So dividing the, the two evidence that we calculated, we can get the bias factor of one against the other. And we get a log bias factor of coherent versus incoherent of about five, 
which is a strong evidence in favor of a coherent signal. We also show the posteriors of Tain for each detector individually and the combination of both. So they are consistent with each other and with the fact that the parameter space of the incoherent analysis should contain the coherent one. Uh, we obtain this bias factor using nested sampling, which is different from the Markov chain in Monte Carlo and Bilby, and employing the rock approximation for the likelihood and the waveform due to computational reasons. So before ending and summarizing, so just a piece of caution, this evidence cannot say anything about whether the candidate is real or not, as far as we don't understand how this kind of test will behave in background noise. So where, is, where we control what there is. So now into the conclusion, uh, we have performed parameter estimation in a subsolar mass candidate. We have found parameters in agreement with the search. We have also found compatibility with a subsolar mass nature of the secondary component sitting at around 85% for both waveforms. And after performing the coherence test, we cannot discard the candidate. On the contrary, we find strong evidence for a coherent signal in H1 and L1. This work, we could say, show that we are ready and capable for analyzing such candidates, if they ever were to be found by any pipeline. So, yes. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much, Jose. Uh, questions? Let me perhaps get this started. So you are saying that the posterior probability for M2 being subsolar is 84%, right? And, but you can, you know, as you, as you may well know, the, the typical shapes of these M1, M2 are very long banana shapes. And that's because of the chirp mass, and especially if you go to the lower mass uh, regime. And so my question is, how often, if you if you actually if the intrinsic signal is a subsolar mass, how often do you get a a tail that would go outside of the subsolar mass? <clears throat> right. Okay. And vice yeah, versa. Yeah. How often, when you have a neutron star? Right, so let's say something above one solar mass, not neutral star. Do you get something that then you know reaches into the subsolar mass band? <clears throat> okay, so thank you for the question. Indeed, uh, indeed, there is something that we have already like uh, tried to ask ourselves. Actually, in the sense of, so we did some analysis on the GW seventeen oh eight seventeen, and if you don't state that it should be above one solar, one solar mass. It got a non-negligible tail on the left, so subsolar in nature. Although, I mean, we kind of know for sure that it's a uh, neutron star and it's above one solar mass. <clears throat> so I'm guessing that for events that are just on the boundary, it's al almost always that you get uh, this kind of tails. If, for example, I'm guessing that uh, because of the, uh, okay, because of the definition in the Chirmas is based on the number of cycles and these kind of events are super long in the detector and so on. <clears throat> if you, uh, as soon as you go to, I don't know, a Chirmas below 0 0.5 or 0 0.8, I'm very convinced that you won't get any doubts that this has to be subsolar. But I mean, uh, out of probability, I, I don't think I can calculate it uh, like this. I hope this answers your question. Okay, um, to, to an extent. Uh, the, the place where I want to go is, is basically, are you at all able, and you, you partially answered this question, are you able to, at all to definitively say, using even just this PE, that something is subsolar mass or, <clears throat> or will there always be a tail that goes into the neutral star regime? Um, but you're saying that for certain regions in the chirp mass, that is still possible. Uh, yes, yes, I, I believe that if you would go like uh, for really low chirp mass, and I'm not saying like 0 0.0 something, no, no, like in the regime of around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, I I would say that probably you won't you wouldn't get any kind of uh, samples of, uh, like in the one solar mass. Okay. Okay, um, let's see, we have a hand up by Juan. Juan, go ahead. Hello, very nice talk, uh, Francisco. So I actually, I wanted Thank to you. comment on, on this uh, question by Johnny. 
Uh, indeed, if you have low chert masses, there's a point at which not even for any value of Q would you have a, a larger than one a solar mass object. But that I'd like to uh, emphasize doesn't mean necessarily that it's a primordial mahal or some other exotic physics, because there are some uh, observations of uh, neutron stars below a solar mass, very near one, but still below one solar mass, which uh, according to the author, this is published in, in science, I think it is, uh, it was a neutron star. Now, the difficulty here is that we cannot tell uh, whether it was a neutron star or a black hole in this case, because uh, the merger uh, and, and the ring down happen at frequencies, as we know from the physical expression, which are beyond our sensitivities. And therefore, we cannot tell apart this Newton star from a black hole. In the future, however, we might be able to see the difference of a Newton star and a black hole below a solar mass, and then convincingly uh, resolve this uh, dichotomy. Notice that we're talking about 120 megaparsecs, so this is an object which, uh, if it would have been a neutron star, the the, the, most, the lightest object, uh, with a black hole of about uh, five solar masses, uh, this uh, inspiraling system would have probably left a signature, a electromagnetic signature, which we might have been able to, to detect at 120 megaparsecs. It's three times the distance to uh, 170817. So it's, it's not completely unrealistic to, to locate the source. Of course, by now, uh, this would have faded away. So we won't be able to tell whether there had been an, an event there. Uh, I don't think anybody has explored whether at the time, so the 1st of April, 2017, an object in the direction of the, in the sky that this object was, uh, according to the TV, uh, was located, uh, emitted any, any signature. So I think all of these uh, amounts to say that uh, this is a very interesting analysis that can be done with uh, future events of a similar kind. And we have to look at the multivariate approach to, to try to disentangle uh, the really subsolar mass nature of, of such an object. But I think it's a, it's a very good start. So uh, congratulations. Uh, Thank you, Juan, thank you Thanks for the comment. Much, for the comment. Uh, Jose, you wanna add something to this? No, 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 I think he maybe, they, he said a, a lot of interesting things about the, the current state of this topic and so on. So. Indeed. Okay, so let me open up the floor again. Any questions or comment for Jose? And okay, well, let's thank all the speakers in, in this block. Uh, and so now we have our second uh, second session, uh, sorry, second break session. Uh, and we're gonna start again at 4.20 UTC. So in 10 minutes time. Um, again, like the previous one, I'd be happy to keep the floor open for any uh, questions or discussions about any of the talks that have passed. Uh, but other than that, otherwise, feel free to take a break and we'll meet again in 10 minutes time. Thank you. So maybe just to get the discussion here going, Juan, you just mentioned that there may be ways to uh, probe whether something is a neutron star, right? And and I, I presume you're talking about any form of tidal deformability measurements. Yes, indeed, this is what I had in mind. Yeah. But for that, uh, either the object is very near us, so that the signal to noise ratio is higher, and at this the merger happens inside the band, or you just simply uh, don't see the merger. It's very difficult unless you are very near the the physical frequency to to start to see the effects from a tidal the formation right. of a neutron star, it, especially if you have a five solar mass black hole, right, as a companion. Yeah. So this this neutron star would be orbiting the this light neutron star, so 0.8 or so solar masses would start orbiting the black hole, would be very quickly totally disrupted because this is a very compact object. The, the black right. hole would be really compact. So uh, the, the 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 distortion would be tremendous, and it would probably flash in in light. We, we very likely would have a like a, an accretion. It would form a disk around the black hole, and and it would hit uh, hit each other. 
So you you probably would see some some emission in light. Uh, I think there are some simulations uh, along these lines, maybe not with such compact objects like a fine solar mass black hole, but neutron stars being disrupted uh, as they orbit around black holes. Uh, they not just simply plunge, okay? So they, especially if they're very compact, you, you might have uh, strong deformations. Yeah. And you should see this uh, in several cycles before the final merger. Right, 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 right. yeah. yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the sensitivity today, but uh, in the future, we might. If it gets completely tidally disrupted, then I guess we won't see it as a as a merger signal, right? It will be completely shred to pieces. And... Well, it depends how many cycles before the merger you see. So the, the initial part, uh, so 100 cycles, remember this are very long uh, duration yeah, yeah. events inside the detector. So the, the first 100 cycles, and there are thousands of cycles now, so first uh, hundreds of them would be mm, post-Newtonian. Yes. And then yes. eventually you start to see the deviations yeah. from disruption. Yeah, yeah, before the merger. So right. it's, it's fascinating that we, we begin to have the sensitivity to explore this kind of object. Yeah, another issue is whether uh, we can tell apart whether it's a, a black hole uh, of one or another kind, primordial or dark matter. I, I think that's a much more difficult uh, the question you made before to Gonzalo. Mm -hmm. it, it's very difficult. Uh, the only argument that I would say against uh, dissipative dark matter is that if, if it's there, uh, it's the only kind of dark matter we have in the universe, then we should have seen this in the rotations of galaxies in the formation mm -hmm. of uh, dwarf uh, spheroidals around uh, the halo of, of galaxies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially Specifically our galaxy. So yeah. we shouldn't see the, uh, because of dissipation, we shouldn't see uh, very small structures below right. 10 to the six solar masses or so, because they would have been dissipated by, by this interaction. Yeah. Yeah. So it, there are consequences, right? So the, the larger the dissipation, the easier it is to form a black hole, but then it also means the, the larger the object uh, it would be. And, and eventually we should see this in, in the correlation function of, of objects at, at small scales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Illustrative structure. Yeah. And there's no evidence for anything like this so far. Correct. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, uh, I mean, I, I know for the, for the searches themselves, we have to start somewhere. But eventually, when we present these results, it is important to keep an eye out on all the other things in the universe that we know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we don't only have compact objects uh, merging. <laughs> We are in a, in a global universe where we have many other effects from dark matter in, in, in many other places. Uh, among others, of course, the CMB. I mean, the consequences of uh, this um, interaction should be felt like some kind of uh, dissipation or exchange of energy between dark matter and, and baryons. And we don't see anything like this so far. But there may be mechanisms to not have it appear in the early universe and then appear later on. Right. screening effects, you know, so that you don't see it on a large scale. I mean, there's always a way out, I guess. <laughs> no, not always, not always, not always. Yeah. This thing, what I said about the, the uh, correlation function for very small mass objects uh, yes, yeah. orbiting our galaxy, that, that's a very strict constraint. Yeah, Correct. actually, we, yeah. I'm a member of the dark energy survey. We put very stringent constraints on this kind of dark matter yeah. already yeah. Yeah. from yeah. the correlation function. Very well. OK. Um, yeah, we still have about five minutes in the break. Are there any other questions or discussion topics people want to bring up? Did, did people enjoy the uh, announcement of the PTA results? Oh, yes, definitely. I got very excited. I think this is not, not only, is, well, it has to be uh, fully confirmed with uh, higher statistics by the international pulsar timing array. So when you put all the, the data together, the European, the Australian, the American, uh, but if, if we get a, a higher support, so more confidence, then uh, this is a tremendous result. It's the first detection of stochastic black hole gravitational waves yeah, yeah. On, on nanohertz. And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, better uh, sensitivities to reach other frequencies, not just the nanohertz. Yeah, and actually, with Lisa, we, we should see this in, in millihertz. Uh, maybe Lightbird will see this in the in the 10 to the minus 18 hertz of the CMB. I don't know. There, there are many. Unfortunately, of course, we have many different sources of a stochastic background. So it might be that at, different, at each uh, frequency range, we have a different type of uh, stochastic background. 
So maybe PTA just saw the one that corresponds to nanohertz, and then there's another one at a millihertz. They have say imagine phase transitions or something like this, or, or cross-ring strings. Some of these cover many different bands, but uh, typically uh, they are more or less narrowly uh, located. Even uh, uh, the one from preheating, the one I, I was uh, studying many years ago, the stochastic background coming from the end of inflation and the conversion to radiation, that typically uh, peaks at much higher frequencies, megahertz or, or even gigahertz. So we don't have detectors there yet, yeah. but eventually we should reach uh, those ranges. I, I, know I think that... this will be this will be a, a very, I would say, um, a nice provocative uh, um, search for other background, just like the CMB was sure. for the other uh, sure. ultraviolet, infrared, gamma backgrounds in, in electromagnetic radiation, of course. Yeah. But we should see other backgrounds eventually. Adding so, up. one thing that you know, maybe it's a more general question to the whole to the whole floor, but. So I, I know that three sigma, I wouldn't say regularly, but more than one occasion has disappeared, at least in the particle physics world. Yeah. Right. Three, two, two, three sigma results have disappeared. How often has that happened in astrophysics? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, however, I think what surprised me, and I've been following this because, uh, as you know, I'm very interested in scratchy backgrounds. I've been following this uh, from PTA over the years, and the difference from 10-year data to 12.5-year data to 15-year data, all of it goes in the same direction. So in the sense that initially you have no evidence, maybe it reaches one sigma, that there is the Hellings and Down correlation. And then as you move forward in, in time, you get more and more data, you start seeing the, the signature appearing. And this reminds me a little bit of the, the way the, the Higgs was discovered at, at the DLHC. So initially we have very little evidence, just a, a few events above the background, and then more and more come in and essentially you finally see the, the whole bump, you know? and you go from two, three, four, five sigma, and then you, you claim detection. And, and then now we have I don't know, more than 20. So I, I think it's, it's good to see that as a function of time, in, incrementing data, it keeps on uh, increasing the, the, the significance. For me, this is, this is telling me something. So we, we're not just fluctuating back and forth between two sigma, three sigma, and then back to two sigma. No, no, we, we are seeing something which builds up right, as right, time right. progresses. Okay. And, and it's true, it was a matter, you, you could always ask, what uh, confidence would you have Con? for the, the number Con? of, yes? Con? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we should really get ready for the next uh, oh, I'm speaker. sorry, I, I talked too much. Uh, just, just, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> um, so it ought to be Andrea. Welcome back, everybody. This is the very last talk of this section. And very aptly, also given the discussion in the, in the break, we're going to end with the, uh, you know, the perspective of this topic, but from Nanograph. And in particular, we've got Andrea uh, talking on behalf of the Nanograph collaboration on uh, the search for new physics in the Nanograph 15-year data set. So Andrea, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as the title suggests, the idea here is to give a very short summary uh, of the results that we found for the search of new physics signal in the Nanograph 15-year data set. Uh, so let me start with a plot or a couple of plots that you probably have seen many times during this, uh, this conference, just to like give uh, a reason for, for the search that we are doing, right? So we are starting to see evidence uh, for a background of gravitational waves in the nanograph band. Uh, these are the results by nanograph, but similar results were published uh, by other PTA collaboration. So we didn't reach five sigma as you were just discussing, but we are confident, I mean, there is a clear trend, and I mean, we are starting to build evidence for, for the presence of such a background. Uh, so I think the next question, and also the natural question would be, what is producing it, right? What's giving rise to a background gravitational waves at such low frequencies? Uh, and there is an astrophysical candidate, which are supermassive black hole binaries. We haven't directly observed uh, one of these binary systems, but we think they're formed in the merger of galaxies but they are not the only possibility. Right? Uh, the other possibility is that this background of gravitational waves is formed in the early universe. And by early universe, I mean everything which is prior to recombination. 
So we knew that a lot of things uh, had to happen during this stage of the cosmological evolution. For example, we need to form dark matter. We need to form the symmetry between uh, matter and antimatter. We know that there is uh, an epoch of exponential expansion of the universe. So it's a very busy time in the history of the universe. And there are a lot of phenomena uh, associated with, again, production of dark matter or binomial symmetry that could give rise to a background of gravitational waves. And this uh, background would propagate essentially um, unaffected through cosmic history and could be what, uh, what we're seeing in our data. And if that's the case, that would be incredibly interesting because these early stages of the cosmological evolution are impossible to directly probe with electromagnetic radiation, right? Uh, these early universe is characterized by such high densities of charged particles that photons cannot really travel. So observing gravitational waves coming from this uh, time of the cosmological evolution would allow us to directly probe this stage of the cosmic history and learn something about uh, um, very high energies, uh, something that we cannot test directly on colliders on Earth. So what we uh, did uh, in our analysis uh, was to study several of these uh, new physics phenomena and also compare them with the standard interpretation in terms of supermassive black hole binaries. So for example, we consider uh, gravitational waves that can be formed uh, during inflation or, or uh, by density fluctuations on small scale, which possibly are related with the formation or the seeds for primordial black holes. Uh, we consider gravitational waves produced uh, by cosmological phase transitions and also by the defects that can be left after uh, a phase transition, such as cosmic strings or domain walls. Now, of course, I won't have time to go through all these uh, models. So I would like to, to focus on, on one specific uh, model uh, just to highlight the kind of analysis that we did for each one of also the other models and the kind of results that we can get analyzing our data. So the model that I will discuss slightly in more detail uh, is our cosmological phase transitions. Uh, so I think everybody's familiar with, with phase transitions. Uh, you, you encounter them in everyday life. If you ever put some pasta, you, you, you face a phase transition. So you start with a bunch of water, which is in the liquid state. And as you start getting the water, you start forming bubbles uh, within the liquid water, where your water has transitioned from the liquid state to the gaseous state. Uh, and these bubbles will expand, collide, and eventually convert all the water into gas. Right. Uh, so something very similar, technically, can take place uh, in the plasma of the early universe. So a simple realization of this uh, mechanism uh, can be given by um, a scenario where you have a scalar field uh, that is permeating the entire universe. Uh, as you expect, initially, this scalar field will be in a configuration that minimizes its potential energy, so it will be at the minimum of its potential. But as the universe expands, uh, it can cool down, and the potential for the scalar field can develop a, a new minimum. And now what the scalar field wants to do is good to go from the old uh, minimum of the theory to the true new minimum of the theory. And this usually, uh, if you have a potential buyer, can take place through the tunneling of the scalar field from the old vacuum to the new one. And this takes place just like in the boiling water, in the boiling water by forming bubbles in the universe within which the scalar field is tunneled from the old to the new vacuum, while the rest of the universe is still in the, in the false vacuum. Now, these bubbles can expand and will expand usually. And while they expand, they can also produce sound waves uh, in, in the plasma. Initially, these bubbles and these sound waves are approximately spherically symmetric, so they don't produce gravitational waves. But as they start colliding, this spherical symmetry is broken, so you have a seismic wall quadrupole. And the energy which is released in the phase transition, at least a fraction of it, can be converted into gravitational waves. So typically, if you want to precisely predict the spectrum which is uh, of gravitational waves, which is produced in such phenomena, it's a highly non-trivial problem. Uh, however, what you generally expect is that the spectrum um, which is produced in, in a phase transition is a broken power law. Uh, so you have a peak frequency and you have a peak amplitude. 
uh, which are fixed by the parameters or uh, of the phase transition. So specifically, uh, the location of the peak frequency is fixed by the temperature of the universe when the phase transition takes place, which is this T star parameter, and also by the typical separation between the bubbles that you're creating at the time of uh, the phase transition. And this is this R star parameter, which is usually also normalized to, to the size of the elbow rate at the time of the transition, which is this H star. Uh, the typical bubble separation also enters in the amplitude, as you can see. Uh, and the amplitude is also controlled by, of course, the amount of energy which is released in the phase transition. And this amount of energy is what we parameterize with uh, this quantity alpha star, which is roughly giving you the ratio between the energy which is released in the phase transition and the energy, uh, total energy density of the universe at the time of the phase transition. Uh, so the, the question now is, can you explain uh, the, the signal that we are seeing in, in our data with a cosmological phase transition? Uh, the answer is yes, and these are the results that we find. Uh, so here I'm comparing uh, essentially the best fit uh, that a phase transition signal can provide to, to the data. So the data are these gray violins, uh, and the, the best fit uh, from a phase transition are these blue lines. So in the in the top panel, I'm assuming that the main production channel for uh, gravitational waves are the collisions of bubbles, while in the lower panel, I'm assuming that the gravitational wave production is dominated by the collisions of the sound wave. So the fit is pretty good. Uh, and now you may wonder, okay, but for what values of the phase transition parameters you, you manage to get this, this fit? Uh, and this is what I'm showing here. So here I'm reporting the uh, posterior distributions uh, for the phase transition parameters, uh, both assuming that the phase transition is the unique source of gravitational waves in the, in the universe, at least in the numbers band. And these are these blue posterior distributions but also considering the case in which the background is produced by essentially a combination of the signal from the phase transition and the one from supermassive black hole binaries, and this is this uh, red distribution. So I think there are a couple of important takeaways from, from these plots. Uh, first of all, uh, you notice that you need a fairly strong phase transition, uh, as you can see from the posterior of the alpha star parameter, which essentially drops to zero when alpha star is smaller than 0.1. Um, and also the, the transition temperature that you need is fairly low. Uh, and what's interesting is that at least uh, for the case in which the production is dominated by bubble collisions, the transition temperature is around the, Q, the QCD scale, where in principle we know a phase transition has to take place. Um, however, in the standard model, the QCD phase transition is not first order, so it wouldn't source gravitational wave. I have a drought modification of the QCD sector that uh, make the QCD phase transition first order in principle that could give rise to, to gravitational waves. Now, in the time that I have left, um, I would like to emphasize a point that sometimes is missed when we discuss these uh, new physics searches in, in PTA data. Uh, oh yeah, but before doing that, this is a quick summary of uh, the other models that, that we consider, right? We didn't consider just uh, cosmological phase transition, we consider a bunch of other models, and here you can see the best fit of these other models to the data. Um, yeah, the main takeaway is that they all provide a fairly good fit with the exceptional stable cosmic strings, which is this blue line in the lower panel, uh, where you can see that the spectrum from this model is a bit too flat to, to, to explain what we're seeing. Okay, yeah, so the time I have left, uh, I would like to emphasize that PTAs are not just a discovery tool, at least for what regards new physics, right? Of course, it would be great if we could discover new physics uh, with PTAs, especially if the background uh, is produced by one of these models. Uh, but even if it's not, and in the end, the, the background is produced uniquely by supermassive black hole binaries, I think there is a lot of information that we can extract from <coughs> PTA observations. And to make this point, I would like to discuss a bit more uh, the cosmic string model, especially stable cosmic strings, right? So in a nutshell, uh, cosmic strings are kind of some defects which are left behind by a phase transition. And going back to the water analogy, uh, think about freezing a bucket of water 
uh, the, the chunk of ice that you're going to get is not going to be perfect. There are going to be defects left behind by the phase transition. And some, something similar can happen when you have a cosmological phase transition. In this case, some of these topological defects are cosmic strings. Uh, this cosmic string can oscillate, and depending on their tension, which is this mu parameter here, uh, they will produce a different uh, gravitational wave background, uh, which is given by this expression. Uh, so as I was telling you, stable cosmic strings are not a great fit to the data. However, we can learn something about these kind of models, uh, because if you keep increasing the value of the string tension, at some point, the signal which is expected from, from these objects is, I mean, way too strong to be compatible with our observations. So what you can do is to uh, rule out all the models of cosmic string, which uh, have uh, a value of the string tension, which is uh, so large that the expected gravitational wave background is incompatible with our data. And this is what I'm showing this plot. Uh, so this plot, it's showing um, the posterior distributions for this uh, uh, string tension parameter mu. So you can see that they all drop uh, to zero at large mu values. And these vertical lines are uh, the upper limits that we were able to place with uh, analyzing the nanograph 15 year data. And these upper limits are stronger than the one that uh, we were able to place before using CMB data or LIGO vehicle data. So again, even if the signal is not produced by these kind of objects, we can learn something about these kind of models. And this is very useful when we're building uh, cosmic stream models. And this is not the only model that we were able to constrain using nanograph data. We were able to constrain model of ultralight dark matter, uh, dark matter substructures, uh, inflation, or um, spreading this gravitational wave. So there is a large amount of information uh, that you can extract from this data, even if they're not producing the background that is starting to appear in our data. So let me conclude. Um, we are starting to see evidence for, for the presence of a background. Again, we haven't crossed the five sigma threshold, but new data yeah, is coming. I mean, we are still uh, keep collecting data. We are starting to combine uh, data of different collaborations. So hopefully, in the near future, we will be able to cross that five sigma threshold. Um, and what I think it's interesting uh, moving forward is really to, to try to understand uh, whether the signal is of astrophysical origin or cosmological origin. And in this direction, I think looking for anisotropies in the background or single sources uh, is going to help a lot. Uh, and hopefully, in the near future, uh, it's going to be able, I mean, one of these analyses is going to be able to, to answer this question. It would be great if the signal is, uh, is cosmological. That would be the first uh, direct observation of physics beyond the standard model. Uh, but even if the, the background is produced solely by black holes, I hope I convince you that there is a lot of uh, stuff that we can learn about new physics by analyzing our data. Uh, that's all, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. And let me open up the floor to indeed see if there are any questions. So I see one hand up by Juan. Juan, take it away. Thank you, Andrea. That was really nice. So when you say that the answer might be known in zero to three years, does that mean we are closer to a few months or, or we really have to wait until three years for the international push of time? No, no. Yeah, no, no, that's that's uh, just uh, my uh, guess from, from me. Uh, and more or less, I hope that's going to be the time scale for uh, the data combination uh, from I mean, the IPTA. Uh, but it's not a given that the data combination is going to allow us to cross the five sigma threshold. Right. Uh, but more or less, that's the time scale on which we should have uh, a bit a better understanding of, of what we're seeing. Hopefully, I have a comment with respect to this. So uh, the significant increase from forty-two to sixty-eight uh, pulsars seem to be uh, mm -hmm. crucial in order to to reach this uh, four or five sigma. So. Uh, Clearly, the European pulsar timing array and the Chinese, probably the Indian also, included many pulsars that were common to both the nanograph and the other uh, collaborations. But what about the, the ones in, in Australia? So can we add up to, say, 100 or, or beyond 100 pulsars and use this to 
to make a much uh, um, stronger con con convincing evidence? Yeah, I think in the audience there are people better qualified, but let me try to answer. Um, so you're right that the overlap between uh, the pool cells that we are observing uh, and the one that are observed by EPTA is much larger compared to PPTA. Uh, the combination of the data, I might be wrong, but it shouldn't reach 100 pool cells, it should be a bit lower. Uh, but keep in mind that, especially if you want to establish that the correlation follows early in some down, what you really care about or what you care about uh, most is the number of pairs that it's in your data set. Right. Uh, and that scales quadratically with the number of pulsars. So even if the increment is not huge, the increment in the number of pulsar is quadratically with the number single pulsar that you have in the data set. So even a small increment can be can give you a lot of information. Even more. I mean, there, there might be locations of pulsars which precisely uh, tackle the the crossings of the Helms and Downs curves through zero. So when it comes from correlated to anti-correlated, so by by looking at those nodes, you might have much better information on the validity of the Hills and Downs description of the correlation. So it's not just any pulsar. You might have very good pulsars well located to, to confirm that you are seeing the Hills and Downs curve rather than a, a common source. Yeah. And also, I mean, having more pulsars, especially the one that are served by PPDA, I think is going to help a lot for searches of and I thought of this, right? Because you're going to get much more uniform coverage of the sky. So essentially your detector and your resolution is going to improve quite a lot. And that, again, it's going to help, especially uh, if you want to distinguish between astrophysics and your physics. So that's another thing that where the combination of the data is going to help a lot. Okay, I had a completely different question, which has to do with the nature of this uh, stochastic background. Can you determine it's chirality. So you be sure that you you have in this background uh, both components, the cross and the plus, or for the moment, I mean, pulsar timing arrays cannot distinguish this. Yeah, chirality. I mean, I think theoretically you can. I mean, because the elements and down is assuming that the background is some polarized, right? If you have a polarized background, uh, I think in principle at least you should be able to see it. Now, I don't think I, I don't know if we have enough sensitivity uh, to see that. But theoretically, it's possible. Um, the elements and down correlation, it's assuming that the background is some polarized. So any level of polarization should leave an imprint uh, in, the and, in, the, in the correlation. Uh, now, yeah, I don't have a quantitative answer uh, regarding whether or not we have enough sensitivity to, to see um, or to test paralysis in the background. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we are winding down the session. Let's thank, uh, I guess, all the speakers from the entire section. And also thank the organizers for putting this together. We, um, I think officially, and this was the last talk, there's still 20 minutes left in the whole block. I think uh, if people want to stay on, I'd be happy to facilitate any any further discussion. If not, then thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And I'll see you hopefully in the other sections. Thank you. <laughs>